Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Marine Depot. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Rapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer, and on today's show, we have a real special treat because we're going to be chatting not only with Jake Adams from Reef Builders, but Chris Meckley from ACI Aquaculture. What's up, guys? What's going on, everybody? Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for having us, Keith. Yeah, really, uh, Thanks for having really us, looking Keith. forward to this uh, conversation. We uh, just going to talk a lot about reef and, and corals and, and um, any other topics. I see there's a whole bunch of people that are tuning into this uh, live stream. I see Blue Reef, Alex Correa is back. It's up there, Alex. Pal, Pal Scotty Damron, Chai Town Reefer. So we got a whole bunch of familiar faces that are uh, back in the, uh, the house. So just uh, most of you all know these guys, but for those of you that do not, uh, Jake is the managing editor of ReefBuilders.com and has recently launched a very cool podcast called Reef Therapy on the Reef Builders YouTube channel. It is also available on all the major podcast providers. Check it out. It is really awesome. It's great content. So do that uh, if you have not done so already. And Chris is the owner of ACI Aquaculture in Plant City, Florida. ACI is a coral wholesaler. Chris, when are you going to launch your own uh, eight? ACI uh, YouTube channel. Actually, we launched it. We just haven't really put any content on oh, it. Oh, come on, um, dude. You're, uh, you're slacking. Be I have, definitely. <laughs> so, well, um, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, we're, um, we're, once we get our team built the way we want it to be, it'll give me some more free time to actually uh, do some more videos and um, launch stuff on YouTube on a weekly basis. Uh, it's just not quite there yet. Cool. So before we start chatting with both uh, Jake and Chris, I want to thank the show sponsor, Marine Depot. I really appreciate Marine Depot being a supporter of the show, and I appreciate you know the support from you folks, the viewers out there, for tuning in. So please spread the word and hit that like button because the more likes we get while we're on live, the more people will find this live stream. So make sure you smash that like button to get that viewership up. And I encourage you folks that are watching right now to ask questions questions in the chat this is live so it can be a very interactive discussion so guys what's uh what's going on what's new ah, all kinds of new stuff going on um 
the reefing world is um, all over the place, of course, and um, I'm just enjoying the corals more than anything because uh, there's been a lot coming in, and uh, it's been a blast to see some of the new stuff that's been available. And uh, I'm sure Jake can contest to that with some of the new um, color morphs and uh, just amazing animals that have been coming into the country. You know, I would say <clears throat> since I started the studio and, you know, have like 50 to 60 linear feet of tanks to to stock, you know, I had my own uh, historical batch of corals that I've had from tank to tank to tank. And there's, there's always, uh, I don't know, it's almost like a, a FOMO as far as participating in, um, you know, the hottest new corals and the latest strains, you know, uh, Acapor Tenuous and uh, the, 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 the Torch Corals. You know, I, I've acquired some of these, but they they don't outshine the classic corals, right? Some of these newer corals in average condition or, or like, all right, here's a perfect example. Um, I was at a coral farm a, a couple of weeks ago and I had, the, you know, the whole menu of different corals, um, I think. And they have, you know, just a lot of different tenuous to look at. And uh, the top shelf aquatics, I don't know, I think they have the Angry Bird and the Looney Tunes. And, you know, you get real close to them. And uh, they got all kinds of crazy colors on the axial core light, the radial core lights, on the tentacles, on the cenosteum between everything. And, it, you know, you look at a macro photograph and it just looks incredible. But you take two steps back and the whole thing is mauve. Right? You take every colors of the rainbow and from two feet away or further, I spent a lot of time looking at my tanks from five, 10, 20 feet away. And for me, man, I'll, I'll just take a solid pink Millie every day, <laughs> you oh. know, a solid pink mini in peak health, not pinkish, but like just luscious with crazy polyps. And so I, I feel like a, everyone has this urgency to get on, you know, all these crazy torches and all these crazy tenuous and just whatever the coral of the week or the month is. And man, you, you, you circle back to a, just a perfect Pavona decusata that's just super fuzzy and encrusts anything that you put it near. I, I get just as much joy, if not more joy, of those than, uh, you know, sensationalized, hyped out corals that have a, a rainbow of color. So that's one of the things I'm doing now is just kind of uh, retracing my steps of, you know, corals that have been hot and, and, and really popular in the hobby and just making sure I, I fill in the gaps um, in my coral collection rather than chase the crazy, you know, newest strains. And it's funny, it's funny you say that, Jake, because um, I was actually enjoying this afternoon putting away all of the, I, when I when we get our corals in, the euphilias, we leave them floating for about you know, overnight so they can just kind of settle into the system. And I was putting them down and I didn't have room under the normal blue light where I normally keep the, uh, you know, all the different gold, different strains of gold torch. And I was putting them down in just straight up 20K radiums. And I'm like, these don't look like they're anything crazy special. <laughs> and, but they're, but they're so, they look more green than anything until you move them into the blue light. And then you see all the gold streaking in them. And I actually think I enjoyed looking at them more because there were so many different strains of green, but you could faintly see the gold in them. And, you know, like you said, with the, with the corals, you and I were talking a couple of weeks ago, you know, when you can see a coral in an aquarium from across the room and it just sticks out over everything, you know, one of the corals I'm going to mention is the, the Acropora Florida that you sent me, um, back a little over a year ago, right about the time that COVID hit, uh, Amanda took an amazing shot of that coral and it has gotten quite large. And when you look in my tank in the back, it's the first coral you'll notice because it's just, it just glows to look at all of the beautiful tenuous with all the subtle colors, like you were talking about that we have, you know, I have to get my face in the view box and down on top of the coral to actually see how insanely beautiful they really are. And like you said, you back off and it, you, you can't see you know, half of them have polyp extensions so much you can't even tell what color they are other than the, the color of the polyps. You know, a, 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 a great example of that, and it's it's a, it's a great coral, is the um, pink Cadillac. Um, yeah. Is yeah. it Microclados or Latistella? Like, yeah, you get up close Latistella. and it's got reds and blue polyps and, you know, a green base and uh, yellow tips. tips. And I've seen big colonies of that. You step back it might as well be brown. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a brown <laughs> coral. I mean, and right? you know, so the whole thing is, right, in terms of the way these corals are marketed to hobbyists, is one picture on a website. 
pretty much that's what you're looking at under you know super blue types of lights to really bring out that fluorescence and so it's really really easy to kind of get hooked into that because you're like wow that is just an amazing looking coral with just like e even if you get some of those multicolor acros looking like the picture un unless it's a super ideal lighting and you know distance you're just not going to see that right and i think vincent chalice he was the one who who summarized it really well when he was doing a few talks um kind of touring the country a little bit and he was saying that you know, people are buying pictures of coral exactly right? they're yeah. buying a picture of the coral they're not really buying that coral they're buying what that coral kind of represents so they can you know some of them they just want to be part of that club to you know go on the forum and say they have this and that and i have been plenty i've been over and visited plenty of yeah you know, we're just talking about sticks right now i've been to plenty of sticks heads stick heads houses <laughs> and checked out their reef tanks in their collection and they have to tell me what everything is because yeah. it, it just it all looks the same so um you know, all my tanks, there's a few tanks that are perennially blue. You know, they're mostly blue. Uh, so my Euphelias are mostly blue, LPS, my Australia wall tank. Um, you know, those are LPS. They just they just glow under, you know, blue light. But uh, the rest of my tanks, they cycle, right? So they'll start out really blue or, you know, deep blue and then a brighter blue and then more like a 10, 12K. And then, then you know, I'll, I'll tune them to every one of them to, to cycle through a more daylight spectrum. Man, I, and I'm lucky because I love blue corals. And right now, blue corals are not popular because in a blue tank, they look black. It's, and yeah. I have a, you know, my yellow tanks look like they just look painted. They're, they're so golden under warmer lighting. And I uh, got a, a, a couple pairs of wild true perculas from Chris. And man, I, I've got a lot of crazy rare fish, and I've had a lot of crazy rare fish in, 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 over the years, but. God, I just those those tr wild true perculas, just solid, you know, orange, black, white, orange, black, white, <laughs> and it, they just steal the show compared to even my domesticated clownfish. I was so glad you got that those um, four fish because we had them for months in that uh, bubble tip tank back there. And uh, when you said you wanted them, I was like, oh sweet, somebody's gonna actually enjoy them. They actually respect the fact that they're oh, a true percula clown. I would and, probably trade in all my domestics for the, the wild types. And and, and oh, so interestingly yeah. enough, I, I uh, connected with a guy who's been reaching for a long time, about my age, um, at Aquashella, and I think he was the one talking about wild true perks. And he had like one left that was 15 years old. I don't remember exactly the story. You know, it was a few beers in, and so I told him <laughs> I told him I'd give him the extra pair. Yeah. Yeah, for a true lover, like here, just pay the shipping and send them off to you. Yeah, I got my pair established. They took two, three big uh, flower pot colonies on the right side of the tank, which is closest to my desk because it's a peninsula <laughs> tank. I'm glad they didn't go to the other side because then I'd never see them. But yeah, but yeah they, you know, that's that's what I'm enjoying. It's just primary colors. <laughs> well, you know, it's it, you know, with uh, we, we used to use um, the Illu Magic uh, Blaze over our uh, acro tank, and um, it cycled on like you do like a ramp from blue to the daylight then back down to the blue at night and you know i, I just couldn't get the colors out of the acros that i wanted and and since i've put up those coral cares I, I put a little too many i put eight of them over an eight by four tank the ramp up period for that on the reef crest mode is very short it's like a half an hour it turns on and a half hour later it's at peak and it stays at peak all day long and it is just at 100% white and blue spectrum. And when you look at the tank with a view box, like you were saying, Jake, the, the corals that stand out to me the most, which is one of the corals I've always loved, is any acropora that's blue or any Monty that's blue. And all of the Montes that we have, the Mariculture Montes that we have, they're just, you see blue and then the polyps look brown. And then when the blues come on, you see the red, the orange, the green, and that still has the blue. The, the base just kind of washes out. And some of the acros that we've gotten in, like the, the millies, when I have just the blues on, I'm not even happy with the way they look. But during the daylight hours, it is so nice to see a blue acropora millipora that just glows. And then yeah, all these yeah. tenuous that are next to it that glow under the blue light that look brown and yeah. just dull and ugly. You know, it's like, you know what? I take the Millie all day long that's blue over a tenuous. I'm I'm just like you when it comes down to the corals. Um I, I like to be able to see it in all different aspects, you know, with the 
all the spectrums. Um, unfortunately, blues are one that does not show very well under blue I, light. My Acropora system that has the most light and is the most daylight, I have a really nice collection of uh, Acropora, Hoxam- Acropora Hoxamai. One's yes. got your name on it, Keith. I know, I, know uh, I got some corals from you. I'm just like super uh, gun shy about shipping during any kind of heat. You know, oh, yeah, it's, it's just hot out so. There, right? so it's just so avoidable. Um, but so I've got a nice patch of the Immortal Tort next to some uh, Acropora hoxami, just solid blue staghorns, next to some Oregon Tort, next to some uh, California Tort, and a few other random blues. And man, when those, when those lights are on daylight, without turning off the flow, you can look through the rib holes and you're like, there's, there's some juice in there. It's just, <laughs> it glows in a way that's... It's similar to fluorescence, but it's just, ah, oh, it just, it's, it really is, you have to see it. Like a photograph, it doesn't glow at you. Like you see the colors on your screen or in, in the magazine, but when you see some of these blues in real life, you know, being illuminated by daylight spectrum, oh, oh my goodness. For, for me, it's like, you know, I've been running 400 watt, 20K radiums in my tanks for, for 25 years or something crazy like that. And so with the new Peninsula tank, you know, I put LEDs on that and the, um, the the um, the light schedule that I got going on that actually mimics the um, the 20k Hamilton um, 400 watt bulb as well as 250 watt um, 20k radium bulb. So I wanted to kind of replicate that look with the um, LEDs that I'm getting with my halides, and it's it's not it's it, it is different. It seems bluer to me in terms of looking at the LEDs. And I've played around with the, uh, the lights a little bit. I've had it on running on like an AB plus type of schedule, which is very, very blue. And when I turn around and look at my other uh, tank that's just running, you know, the uh, the 400 watt 20K radiums plus some T5s, that tank looks yellow when I'm looking at that tank, at, you know, after turning away from the uh, the, the LED dominant um, um, peninsula tank. So uh, you get used to whatever light you have. You know, I know a lot of other folks were all about the radium 20K. Um, but man, I, if I did, when I did metal halides, um, I was much more of a fan of the Iwasaki 65 K because the, it, it, it just, it was, it was too white for a lot of corals, but man, you could take a, just like a standard blue tip staghorn, right? It was so uh, photosynthetically efficient, not in terms of par, but in terms of spectrum that all the brown tissue just turned a light golden yellow with yep. blue tips. Yep. So, um, and, and, and- Go ahead, Jake. Hey, we used to. Go ahead. It hey, seems kind of to... counterintuitive, but for some reason, the daylight spectrum brings out blues like oh, so much more. And anybody who has a blue tank, I'm sure you don't have any purple corals in there, or or like birds' nests. You know, same same type of deal. Um, but yeah, 65k. That's my choice for metal halides. So we have a bird's nest that's a, we call it the Johnny Jump Up, and under all blues, it's green with purple polyps, with when I put it underneath the coral cares, it turns beautiful pink with yellow tips. Mm. And it's that full spectrum that, you know, one of the things that we always had a problem with, with wild um, seriotoporas was keeping that pink coloration. And I remember when we used to grow all of our acros under 65K Iwasakis and the pinks would stay insane. And as soon as we moved them under, under our 20K, mm. all that pink would go away. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that full spectrum light of the 65K, you know, there's for, to me, there's nothing better than looking at a uh, tricolor Acropora uh, Valida. Yeah, been classic growing Valida on, or Nana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, growing underneath of a 65K Iwasaki, they just glow. And that coral is so underrated nowadays because of the fact that everybody has blue light and you don't actually get the intensity of that coral's you know, the beauty of that coral doesn't shine under under the under the blue light, and it's something I think we're missing. And it, it's it's. Um... Oh, I'm not missing it. <laughs> oh, I'm not. Even. <laughs> I um, I you know, I'm using these opportunities when people's attention are distracted by bright, shiny new things the price on other corals and the demand for other corals is so much lower. You know, I, you know what? I, I think the ORA deserves a shout out, right? They have such an incredible catalog of stylos, bird's nest, acros. And Ew. if you, you know, if you stick some of these things under super blue light, you're not going to get it. But like, I remember when Eric Kamano frag farmer got one of the first colonies of green tip 
pink bird's nest and everybody freaking lost their minds. There was waiting lists and waiting lists mm-hmm. and, you know, I never really got any. And maybe uh-huh. earlier this year, I got some from, from ORA and it's just mind blowingly cool. It's such it a freaking cool coral. So yeah, you know, or catalogs like those from ORA that are still super classic, man, I, I depend on them to, uh, you know, ha- have this arc of the classic corals that all three of us um, are very familiar with. I just um, picked up a bunch of frags, and probably the favorite frag of the bunch is... From Ore? No, from another um, oh. um, guy, Coral. He's You got to check this guy out near uh, the Boston area. Um, incredible coral farm. I'm not going to throw out his name. He wants to keep a low profile. I picked up a bunch of juicy frags from this guy. And uh, probably my favorite in the bunch, um, I, I hate to drop a name here, but the Larry Jackson Purple Acro. If you guys, that's, that's a Validia, Purple Validia. And that, uh, to me, is such a cool coral with the purple tips, and it's kind of got the greenish, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Base with the yellow polyps. Yeah, it's such a, uh, and you just don't see that coral around. You don't see it, you know, offered up on, on websites for sale. It's just, um, I, I, I dig just, that stuff. This is one reason. Man. This is one reason that I go to a lot of stores because you never know where something might be traded in. And uh, again, earlier this year, somebody brought in a colony of Valida like this freaking big and I got a frag that today would be considered a small colony. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, they just hit the ground running. I don't think it even cost me like 20 bucks, you know, for a chunk, you know, of, a, of an actual tank grown, super classic strain. Um, and I know it can take even brighter light, but you know, I have a sort of isolation system that's not quite quarantine. Um, but yeah, you know, when people are distracted by bright, shiny new things, it just makes it my, my job easier to get corals that I really love. <laughs> so we have some, you know, uh, yeah. go ahead there, Chris. I was going to say, you know, you're talking about like the, the tricolors, the, the Valitas and the Sicalis, you know, I can get them in and they will sit here in my facility and I can take photo after photo after photo of them. And it can be the cheapest Acropora. And in my opinion, one of the most beautiful on the, on the shows that I put up, the slideshows I put up and nobody will buy them. And, it's frustrating because I think it is probably – it's a classic like Jake said, and it's something that I think you know everybody should have in their aquarium is all the classic corals and you know just piece in the other this, these crazy little funny, funny names on all these corals that are available right now. But you know I, I don't even request to get that coral anymore unfortunately because I ended up – I think we had like 40 of them sitting in here from Americulture from multiple shipments. That was probably four or five shipments of Americultures and they just sit here and grow and get prettier and it was they were taking up space. And it's frustrating because I think that the coral is absolutely stunning and it's a shame that the way – the whole hobby is gone is if it doesn't have, you know, if it's not a tenuous for like five different colors in it under blue light, you know, nobody would, nobody wants them. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting how things have gone, but, um, it's unfortunate for some of these beautiful classic corals like Jake was saying, cause they just don't get the love they deserve. You know what will happen? Like <clears throat> the right person, one of these hype men, uh, we'll, we'll get their hands on one and for the first time ever, they'll actually see the beauty and they'll give it a crazy <laughs> name. It'll be like $250 for a shard. Yep. <laughs> and you're like, that's the most common coral on the reef. Like, <laughs> you know, um, I don't see it as unfortunate. It's unfortunate that, um, this generation has, ne- hasn't had the exposure and they haven't developed in the ap- appreciation because, I would I would say there's ten thousand varieties of corals, right? I don't Amazing. I know there's three hundred acros Amazing. and I think there's about a thousand scleroctinia. And then there's ten thousand strains. I mean I got twenty five, thirty varieties of, of flower pot corals. We should circle back on that in a little bit. It's it's unfortunate yes, for them, but it's an opportunity yes. for me because once again, I remember when the first two harsenoids first, you know, came in, hundred dollars a frag which was a lot of money 20 years ago for you know, aquarium coral prices. Um, the watermelon alien eye chalice. Yeah, nobody wants that anymore. Okay, give it to me. <laughs> give it to me. Yeah, I will, I will buy up multiples. If it's 40 or $50 for, you know, kind of a, almost like a mini two to three inch starter colony. God, I remember when that, you know, eBayed for $400 for one my collection, one mouth. And it's, it's unfortunate for some, but it's an opportunity for me. So oh, we, ha- we have a couple of... Um questions from the uh, from the viewers and also i just want to remind folks to uh, please hit that like button 
so we can have more folks find this uh, stream. But Alex Correa has got a question. Can you guys please talk about the A efflorescence and also the A humilis and the Jennifer uh, and how often do you see them? I get them in my heart. <laughs> Jake, Jake, you've gotten some humilis from me. And, um, I've, I've got, got uh, four or five colonies of humilis. Um, one's kind of rainbow. One is like neon green polyps with kind of a subtler base, and it just looks like little stars on it. And it's um, it might even be monticulosa because those branches they are short and super stubby. Um, then I got the, um, uh, then I got a, a really blue colony. I mean, you know, affordable price like this freaking big from Chris a few weeks ago. I still haven't put it under like the brightest light and the brightest flow. Uh, man, those scores are hardy. Just give them all the light, <laughs> give them all the flow. I use them as breakwater for the rest of the coral. <laughs> like, like, like flow hits the humulus, and they're actually elevated off the bottom so they can get you know more of that open area water flow, and it just kind of disperses and hits the uh, you know the PC rainbow and the pinky bear and you know you guys like those funky names. I know a couple. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got some humulus and. Uh, um, I've only got a few frags of efflorescence. I had to sacrifice my two-foot diameter um, Acropora efflorescence that I picked up uh, this time last year because it was a flatworm farm. They I are dipped, amazing. I dipped worms. it a couple times in like <laughs> 10 gallons of dip, and it was just mega, mega, mega store storm. So, yeah, yep. Acropora efflorescence all day, every day, man. I love it. I've got a few frags growing out, but I always, I always down for more. Yeah, it was 10, 10 gallons. gallons. I, you know, I just happened to have like a <laughs> like a two-foot cube uh, right? tank just kind of sitting aside. It was perfect size. I put the coral in there with a power head. And yeah, you know, I was like burning through Revive just to get it off. And it, they just came back in no time. And it, what's crazy is like, I have never, it, it, at the studio, found flatworms on anything but Eflo. Like, mm. what the hell? <laughs> and no, I, I just had to make this weird sacrificial cost of huh. just like, I, I can't leave this coral in here and risk it infecting everything else. You know, I, the, the shadow caster Eflo I sent you back, I don't know how long ago that was. That was back, I guess, Irma. You got a small piece of it. And um, that coral was exactly, you know, what we, like you said, a flatworm magnet. It was the only acro that we went through our dip process to get it back on the farm. And we put through, I don't know how many dips and it just never failed. You know, when we finally said, okay, it's clean. We put it on the farm. Well, the next thing you know, we're seeing the bite marks again. And I'm just like, how, how, how is this possible? We, we, we've gone through so much, but when we dip our acros, we're doing 15 gallon dips on a regular basis. Um, yeah, this was 10 gallons trace. for one coral. Wow. <laughs> it took up all the volume two by two by about 10 inches deep. Uh, that, that would be a coral I would love to have my hands on. Um, you know, efflorescence always been one of my favorite acropores ever since I've been in, you know, a stick nut, which has been since I've been pretty much reefing. Um, but uh, the efflorescence, solitariensis, gemifera, humilis, monticulosa. You know, I think it was Alex here that mentioned about those. Um, that Keith asked the question about those corals. I can get them anytime I want them, but I get them in small numbers because it feeds my addiction more than anything. And um, I know somebody like Jake will end up taking them after a while if they're just sitting here in my facility so he can color them up and enjoy them. I will them because... buy <laughs> almost any healthy brown acro. Oh, because, it's awesome. Because I know that they don't collect ugly corals off the reef. Like some of them, okay, you kind of know what they're going to do and maybe the potential might be uh, you know, kind of a narrow scope. But it, it's also crazy, man. I remember used to buy $5 brown acros uh, colonies because they were browned <laughs> out. And now people want their actual cost of the coral, <laughs> you know, 50 bucks with shipping. And I'm just like, no, no thanks. <laughs> I know it's funny because there's the notorious corals from Australia that we get in that we, I just know for a fact, if I don't move them fast enough, I just can't give them the conditions that they need in my in my system that we're holding them in. Now, if I take it and put it on my farm, I can usually hold the colors and actually they can improve. But I have, I think, um, I don't even know how many. There, there's probably a dozen or so brown acros that I sent some to you, did and I? I think I did. Yeah, one of them was, a, a, bunch was of them. a humulus. Yeah, a, a, mm -hmm. a humulus. Um, but it's there's just certain species that we bring in from the wild that when I get them, I'm just like, oh man, if I don't move this thing in, you know, three or four weeks, it's gonna probably be brown. But then, for me, the fun of having that coral come in beautiful putting it in my system and it not being in the exact conditions that it needs to be in, it's staying healthy. 
enough that it, you know, is still kicking and then taking it and fragging it up into pieces and then putting it in better conditions or like my farm and then just watching it and crushed and bloom back into the original beautiful coral that it was when it, when it was, when it was imported. Um, there's, there's so many species out there that do that. I mean, heck, Melitas and Cicales and what is the uh, Cerealis, they're notorious browners as soon as they um, come in, if the conditions aren't correct for them. And they're just getting to the, to the point of coloring up corals and brown corals. I used to do the same thing you do, Jake. I used to go down to a local shop here in Tampa you know, when I was a hobbyist and didn't have ACI and, you know, I was poor, didn't have, well, I'm still not, you know, anyways, it is what it is, but I, I barely could even afford an, a coral for my own aquarium. And I'd go and buy brown corals from the local shops. And I remember getting my first Superman, Monty. It was brown as brown could be. And I'm like, yeah, I, I want to try the Monty. I want to try this acro. And some of those corals just turned into what they had, you know, back then, you know, that, that was it, who named the Superman? Was that Tubbs? Or some of those, Tyree, I think. somebody wasn't it? Well, I guarantee you, those came from co- coral reefs in Solomon's. It pro- yeah, like I don't I care mean, who named it, but like you know, it's a monopora monasteriata, no matter what you call it. But like you know, people are always you know looking for the shiniest, newest, uh, um, stylosine yellow or uh, samacora, which are awesome corals, but. Goodness gracious, man! You get a Superman or a rainbow or a sunset in in this perfect Star. condition. It's, yep. it's gonna outshine all the new stuff. It's awesome! Oh, you guy. won't even need a macro lens. You'll be like, "What the hell is going on here?" I still remember the first time I saw a photograph of a, you know, this <laughs> rainbow of polyps on a you know blue base monopora. I thought that sh- I thought it was totally fake. I was like, "This there was no way." And I've been diving and I've seen them. I've seen a a, a single like head. A boulder of 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 rainbow montebora <laughs> that had a couple of feather dusters coming out. I took some pictures. I was like, "Holy crap!" You know, that's awesome. Uh, Ten or fifteen years ago, that would have been a hundred thousand dollars. It was like it was so <laughs> freaking big. Like, not even kidding. A hundred G's if there had been enough reefers to pay that, pay for that. And so, you know, um, I know this is a little bit of a, of a side segue, but you know, people want to complain about high coral prices. It's just like, man, just do your research. Just find out about some of the old corals. You can walk into just about any freaking store and they can buy frags from just about any freaking wholesaler and they can sell, you know, 20 to $30 good size chunks of rainbow Superman sunset, you know, and other classic strains and they won't look the part, right? They won't look the part. They'll be muted. They'll be brownish. They'll be dull. There'll be some hints of red, some hints of blue and just, it's on you. It's on you to, to so, put it in the right conditions, and it will and, blow your mind. So let's let's talk exactly. let's talk about those right conditions. I saw somebody um, made a comment about trace elements. You know how important are trace elements to coloring up? Uh, let's call you know let's talk about SPS. You know what about? I know Chris is gonna I know Chris is gonna be long winded on this, so I'm just gonna put in <laughs> you know like uh, a, a preface on this. There are no conditions. The ocean is the ocean. It is a very specific set of parameters, which makes it this is really silly that people acclimate from one reef tank to the next when we're trying to hit ocean conditions, right? Yep. There is no magic formula. Now, if you have an average reef tank and you're just adding a couple corals, your trace elements aren't going to go anywhere, right? There, there's going to be plenty of a reservoir there for those corals and you can get by with water changes it's just when you start getting to a point of high density and commercial scale like chris that you really need to start paying attention to those things but if you have a you know an average display tank probably with blue light and you're you know, dosing some broad spectrum stuff and doing your water changes like don't even worry about it you know just hit normal seawater parameter levels and and go with it. But then if you're you know if you're a stickhead and you have a ton of stuff going on, I'm sure Chris has some uh, some thoughts on specific things you can do. Well, you know, with, with trace elements, I mean, something that we've been playing around with a lot for the last um, well, in September, it'd be about a year since I've been using the Captivate Turf MT, which has now been reformulated to just the Captivate MT Isolate MT. It's a minor trace supplement, and um, you know, some of the things we've learned, you know, over this time period, um, some of the things that are very interesting is, you know, mo- most of the um, coral tissues don't even utilize these traces whatsoever. A lot of it is has to do with the algaes and needing the trace is to do their job properly so one of the things that we learned with um the traces and there's a there's a multitude of them in there that are very beneficial to especially zoos and thaly so zoos and thaly of course everybody knows what it is it's what 
gives the coral its color when they're when they're happy when they're bleached they are lacking zooxanthellae and uh, the zooxanthellae feeds the corals um uh, so the symbiotic relationship um uh, you know is 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 very important and the health of the zooxanthellae is somewhat what we're really playing around with trying to figure out exactly what traces are very beneficial to the um health of the zooxanthellae which in turn then will allow them to produce um more sugars so they can feed the corals. So then in turn, the coral needs less zooxanthellae in its tissue, which gives it a lighter color, which is, of course, one of the things you see in acropores we get from in, in, from the wild. They're usually a lot more pale than what we see in, in our aquariums. But again, that also has to do with the fact of, you know, super intense sunlight versus, you know, just straight blue light in most cases. But one of the things that we found is vanadium is so important for goniopores and their health and their color. And it was all just playing around with adding individual traces after we started adding the MTs. And as we've been playing around with that, I've got my friend Gene from Reef Labs. He's been doing um, a lot of the same things that I've been doing. Um, but you have to make sure you have traces in your water. I mean, the, the salts that we're using don't have natural seawater levels of traces in them. It's impossible to do because some of them are so minute when they're doing a blend you cannot blend the two tons worth of salt and have, you know, one half a gram of vanadium go throughout the entire blend and be equal. So, so we're talking about some esoteric elements, right? Like rubidium and vanadium, vanadium, vanadium. and some of the larger manufacturers, they've just in. kind of decided, you know, some of these are rare earth elements that are expensive to, to acquire and to add. And it's just like there's not really much documentation for those. And, you know, I definitely some of these salt mixes um, that are not created by actual hobbyists. They're made by, you know, bean counters. Um, they just kind of decided to leave them out. But, um, Chris, I know you still have more to say on this. I just want everybody to know that as you're listening to Chris, he is growing uh, corals in very high density, right? So the things that he's doing don't necessarily translate Fly. to a generic average reef tank. And by average, I'm talking about really nice reef tanks these days, you know, Good point. and I have, I, you know, I've, I've gone through the periodic table. I've gone, you know, I've, I've, I've played around with zinc, played around with iron, played around with strontium, played around with iodine, molybdenum, um, and a few others. And you know what? Every time I do one of those things, yeah, okay. Corals, some corals it perked up, uh, you know, 5%, but, None of them are, are, are a replacement for having just a good baseline of chemistry, right? Keeping your yeah, magnesium, exactly right. calcium, alkalinity on point. I, I'm not super yeah, huge on stability unless you, you know, you're really a stickhead. Like my, my, my alkalinity might go from 7 to 11 from week to week, but I just keep it in that range and I don't really see any issues. Um, but yeah, you, just, <laughs> you have to have that baseline foundation the fundamentals there is there is no trace element that's going to light your tank on fire it's just not going to happen right a bit balance master your fundamentals go back and read books books remember those things that you know over here that that talked about the fundamentals go back and read that stuff when you've mastered your calcium, alkaline, magnesium, your salinity in parts per thousand your temperature your phosphate pH. and your nitrate and your pH, you know, for growth, we, we beat that one to a horse. Up <laughs> we beat that one. That, that horse is totally, totally dead. There's not even like traces of the body left yet. We're, we're, maybe we can avoid that. But yeah, just master your fundamentals and your, your corals will blossom. They'll flourish. And stability. And, you know. Stability. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not super huge on that. My, 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 my calcium might go from, again, 350 to 450 over a couple of weeks. I, I, I'm, I'm not bringing it up i'm just saying for me it's you go to the ocean tide comes in tide comes out that water's different storms yeah, roll exactly. roll through it's exactly. very different right there there is a lot more dynamic uh parameters out in the ocean i just want uh, before chris gets into some of his you know fringe chemistry i want <laughs> everybody you know the majority listening to this are not commercial coral producers right they just uh, want a beautiful reef tank master your fundamentals and then start what, paying attention to some of what, these. What elements. about I'm Chris? I'm sorry, right. I'm going well, to interrupt um, you here, You're but right. um, I think this is important. What What about like you know <clears throat> the Triton method or uh, Moonshiners? That's very specific. And those aren't those aren't methods. They're not methods. I'm sorry. You can call a method all you want. It's the it's actually it's just actual seawater chemistry. <laughs> Pretty much. You know? 
it's just it, you can put a name on it and try to, you know, try to dress it up and, and call it Zeovit. You can call it Triton. You can call it like Moonshiners. It it's just the court doesn't care what trend you're following. It's like, you know, in my opinion, there's all the different, all those different methods, you know, or, or it's like naming a coral. It's not, it's not necessary. Um, you know, you, you, you have, like you were saying, stability, you know, honestly, I don't believe that stability, you know, I should, I believe in stability in, in the alkalinity side of it. Yeah, and the pH alkalinity side of it. and pH. I know when it, when it comes down to calcium and magnesium, the only thing that I notice when I have magnesium levels dropping below like 1250 is Monty's don't like it as much. I've they just said don't the same shine. Thing. Always you know? said the and same thing. I, I try to keep mine at like 1400, 1500 because I know all, I, I, we grow a lot of Monty's. Like we got 60 different varieties of color morse and varieties of Monty on the farm. And I can tell when the magnesium levels are low because my, you know, especially the knotty spirals and the, and the, uh, what is the, um, the beach bum? If the magnesium is low, they just don't glow. And, um, with this, calcium, is, this is true. I've used monoporas <laughs> as a litmus test for magnesium. Anyone, if they come at me about any problems, say hey, my Monty's don't look good, magnesium, but just dose yeah, it. 100%. 100%. You know, and magnesium can be a tough one to get up. You know, if your magnesium level is low, like uh, we, we did, um, we had magnesium drop out in one of the newer systems that we had. We weren't mo really monitoring it, and uh, magnesium was down to like 1,200. And to get that back up to the 1,400, 1,500, I was. <laughs> it takes we a lot. Oh, we put like probably a half a five gallon bucket of magnesium in the system over a period of two weeks to get it up. And uh, then it's just flat lines and it stays stable. But something that I don't think anybody should really be worrying about being super stable is calcium. And I used to be a firm believer that your calcium levels need to stay, you know, between 390 and 450. Well, when we started doing our pH boosting, I'm not going to go into that a whole lot, but my, uh, my calcium levels, because of dosing the hydroxides, had you know, with even with the calcium reactor, when it finally kicked back in, our our, our magne our calcium levels were down to two ninety nine for about hmm. three months. And two ninety nine, I'm freaking out. I'm like, what the so, heck so, is going so on? So one thing is, if, if my calcium hits three fifty, I know I'm still adding fifty ppm per day, even if it doesn't go up. I'm still right. providing that chemistry. And I know it's not a popular opinion, but I've got like a dozen tanks that I've been doing all kinds of stuff with. And if, you know, you go out the to, to the ocean. You know, your pH might not change so much. The salinity and the, the mineral balance won't change so much. But, man, that salinity goes all over the freaking place. And, um, and the higher you get your pH, the more the higher your range is. Your pH just doesn't range in the ocean more than, like, half a point. Exactly. Half a point. The, almost everybody's reef tank in a normal range is going to range 0.2. You know, yep. uh, pH of 0.2. <laughs> Every day, no matter what, no matter what you do. And if you exactly. start pushing that up, you'll start getting a range of 0. 0.3. So where's yep. that stability? Like we're talking about every single day that shift is happening. But exactly. it's, it's just, it's not hurting your corals. Obviously you don't want to get down to 7.5 or up beyond nine. Uh, my upper limit has been like about 8.5, 8.6. I've noticed like if I push yeah. it to 8.5, that's when the STN wants to start popping up a little bit and it's just not worth it. Just keep it a solid 8.4 and you know, it's much easier to drive a race car 80 miles per hour than hundred miles per hour. So, um, there's a comment in here by Brock B and, and he's, um, he wants to, um, you know, make a comment about, uh, the Triton method and says, uh, if Jake is stating Triton or moonshine or just seawater chemistry, why do each of those two sources suggest different target levels of each trace element? So what, what? the only target level that matters is natural seawater. Yep. Unless you're a commercial producer like Chris, you might want to aim a little bit higher. So you have some, a birth when your corals just, you know, just decide to have a really great week or something. Right. What? But you if know, you're keeping natural seawater levels, like you know, if you're if you're keeping your 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 alkalinity at nine, but you're adding let's say one degrees worth of, of, of buffer per day, is that any better than keeping it at seven, but you're adding two degrees of, of alkalinity per day? No, because your corals are just they're consuming it, right? The they, corals they will tell you. Yeah. I mean, the corals, you can look at your corals. If your corals don't look happy, something's wrong. You know, I mean, your corals will tell you exactly what's going on in your aquarium. I mean, one of the things that was bothering me when I first started doing some pH boosting and my alkalinity went all the way to 13.8 in one of my coral systems. I was freaking out because usually about 14 is when you start seeing precipitates coming out. This stayed up around 13.8, 13.6 for probably two and a half months. And then after the hydroxides were being put in there for that amount of time and what was inside the system that was not already being created but was you being used up and it finally started falling back down then my calcium started dropping down and 
you know, you just, the corals, just look at your corals. You know, if your alkalinity is through the roof and your calcium is through the floor and your magnesium is through the roof and your corals look super happy, they'll tell you when you're not happy and they'll tell you when you need to fix something in your system. One thing that I think, um, you know, all of these uh, opinions about reef water chemistry, um, they will all agree that it's much better to have low across the board or high across the board than to have your calcium really high, your magnesium really low, or vice versa, right? And, you know, in general, I might tell somebody to keep their salinity at 33 parts per thousand just in case they're adding two part and they might up to 34, 35 parts per thousand over time, right? So these are these are uh, rules of thumb that have been introduced to give, uh, you know, reefers a little bit more of a berth right. in case it gets a little bit too low. So the only chemistry that matters is natural seawater chemistry. If you're just trying to have a, a really nice reef display, display, which is 99% of people listening to all reef aquarium content, just aim for that natural seawater chemistry. Now, if you're a commercial producer or you have a lot of stick heads or a lot of you know frags in your tank, or you're doing a lot of fragging and your corals need a, a, kind of a bigger reservoir, a better, bigger pool of elements because they're gonna, they need to heal. Um, there's reasons for that, but. But yeah, you know, like like I like I said, uh, just natural seawater chemistry is what corals okay. need. So let's let's back um, to Brock's question. Sorry, I just wanted to touch base with yeah. Brock's question here. You know, I mean, you know, when it comes down to like an algae turf scrubber, I mean, there's nobody that can tell me that if any of you, if you put an algae turf scrubber on your aquarium because you want to naturally remove your nutrients, which I don't agree with any of the chemicals that are out there for putting in your aquarium, you know, lanthanum. Um, aluminum oxide. I, I don't, I don't agree, agree with any of that stuff being put into your system. I think you can do it naturally. And the downfall to doing it naturally in some cases is, you know, Brock, you will reduce your trace elements if you have an algae turf scrubber on your system, especially if you have, a, you know, the ones that we're using by Clearwater Scrubbers, they target the phosphates, which, you know, we haven't done any chemical dosing to remove phosphates in our system. But the downfall to having the scrubber on our system and the fact that we were stripping the nutrients out over time, it ended up stripping all the trace elements out of the out of the system. And then the scrubber did not do its job. It didn't work. We didn't have any copper. We didn't have any iron. We didn't have any um, molybdenum. There's no, there was no, there was pretty much everything across the board on the traces was completely stripped out. And algaes need these elements to grow properly and to do their job. So we had no growth on our scrubbers after about six months. It just completely stopped doing what it was doing for that first six month period of time. So that's when we started adding the traces back into the system to get those levels back up to, like you said, Jake, natural seawater levels, which then the scrubber got back to working properly. And then the biggest downfall that we found was, you know, the scrubber did strip your iron out quite quickly. And something that we learned um, just recently is if you see dinoflagellates in your aquarium, um, I guarantee you don't have any iron in your water because um, we started dosing iron after uh, we started seeing dinos. And the 24 to 48 hours later, once we got the iron level to natural seawater levels, the dinos completely disappeared. And the reason being is because the algae can't do its job because there's no nothing to feed the algae to grow, which is the iron. And... What happens? Mother Nature takes over, and dinoflagellates come in and start taking care of those minor amounts I of nutrients that are in the water. I can verify this observation because I don't have dinoflagellates in my tanks. I have uh, had dinos in my um, uh, spinning ketomorpha chamber. And it was um, kind of, you know, just a little bit tedious every three or four weeks, just kind of pull out the keto and just kind of scrub it all down. So I didn't have a dino problem. Um, and I was just casually dosing a little bit of iron. Then I just noticed, like, man, within a week to 10 days, all the bubbles are gone. It had, it had shifted over to from a, you know, a slimy, bubbly biofilm to, a, you know, definitely a lot more pleasing, just kind of, you know, thin film of various turf algae. So uh, a couple of things. Paula Pal, thank you so much for that super chat. And folks, keep uh, keep your questions coming in the uh, the chat. I will do my best to keep track of them. So um, a couple of things I wanted to dig in on. Um, Jake, you, you, you've mentioned a couple of times in terms of just target natural seawater levels. Except, I'm going to let you get to the question. I'm going to let you finish, but <laughs> there is, again, everything I'm saying, unless you are a commercial producer like Chris, I have told customers when I worked retail for a long time, do not chase the numbers. I have no idea what my iron is. I have no idea what my iodine is. I have no idea what my zinc is. But if you add some, 
That is infinitely more than adding none. 100%. So, so hit 100%. those natural seawater levels of temperature, salinity, calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. You know, it makes you got a little, a little phosphate, a little bit of nitrate in there. Everything else, if you're dosing a little bit of iron, don't chase the numbers, right? Don't get in on your ICP test and just worry that you're at 50% seawater level. You have some. You know you're adding some, right? It's like having, it's yeah. like a man in the desert. If he has nothing to drink, you give him one bottle of water. It's, it's, it's going to match. It's going to matter so much. And even, you know, as you creep up towards those natural seawater levels, you're going to get diminishing returns. So adding some trace elements is probably the best advice for anyone who's listening to this conversation right now, who's going to stress about their iodine and their zinc and their iron. <laughs> it's like, don't, don't do that. Just add a tiny little bit. And don't even worry about the levels. Observe your corals and, you know, over time, maybe become familiar with how that affects your tank and maybe supplement that with some ICP tests. P-Guy, thanks again. Uh, thanks for the super chat. So, so Jake and, and Chris, what about uh, nitrate and phosphate? So, you know, natural seawater in terms of nitrate is, I think, what, close to 0 0.01 parts per million. And, uh, you know, that's getting very close to, uh, you know, zero uh, nitrates. How, how important is it to have nitrates in the system? You know, I know... From my personal experience, whenever I'll get close to zeroing out nitrates and phosphates, I could see the coloration of my corals starting to fade. So, you know, how important... I think the marine scientists will take this one. <laughs> in, in the ocean, uh, nitrates and phosphates are, are, are what's called oligotrophic levels, right? They're really low. That doesn't mean that there isn't nitrogen or phosphorus in the ecosystem. It's just so tightly cycled that it's the moment it becomes bioavailable, something will take it up. Right. So that's one of those few natural seawater levels not to follow because in our, our reef tanks, we don't have this 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 locked up pool of phosphorus and nitrogen. And so, um, you know, man, I, I've, I've struggled. I, I'm a lifelong coral starver. You know, I, I've, I've fed my corals and I don't have you know sand in my in my tanks. And um, just just very recently, I mean, I'm started dabbling and dosing nitrates a year ago, which felt very strange. And now I realize, like, I just can't, can't feed enough yeah. uh, yep. to keep the nitrates up. And uh, for the phosphates, though, I can give my fish, you know, one good feeding of mysis shrimp once a week, and that'll hit the target. But there's yeah. a big difference between what your actual level is and mm. how much is in your system, right? right? If you're dosing 5 ppm of nitrate, but you're still reading 0.01, you're still giving your corals five ppm of nitrates every day. Exactly. Right. So it's not about absolute numbers. You also want to be aware of how much is being input into the system. Right. And the corals yeah. are consuming a lot of that stuff. So you have, if you have a lot of corals in the tank, they're the ones that are sucking up that nitrate and the phosphate. So you got to be aware of that. And, um, you know, with my uh, 187 gallon tank, that uh, SPS dominant tank, chock full, full of corals, I don't need anything, uh, you know, I've stopped using Ketamorpha on that tank, and so I really don't need to do anything other than run a protein skimmer to just kind of keep my nitrates and phosphates in check. It's really the corals that are doing that job in terms of that exporting the nitrates and the phosphates. I think most most stickheads will, you know, who've been watching these levels, which are about to get easier because um, uh, Hannah just released this just basic, <laughs> they call it the high range nitrate checker. I think it goes up to two. And uh, so it's going to be a lot easier. <laughs> Because that's one of the that's that's been one of the gaps in our tools, right? If you've ever used a nitrate test, it goes zero, one, five, a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like clear, barely pink, kind of pink, fuchsia. That's and why it's I just always use really freaking hard. Don't even start. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. I did. He's, he's the only one that likes it. I still use it all the time. Not even going there. But yeah, the new Hannah checker is 50 bucks <laughs> and it's going to give you some real readings. And I think a lot of stickheads will, will generally agree. The ones who are, you know, growing a lot of stonies and paying attention to the levels, uh, you know, a healthy Acropore tank will consume one to two PPM of nitrate per day. You know, and I see that in my reef tanks. I don't have any denitrators. I only have, uh, you know, the ketomorpha chamber on, on one big system. Um, and across the tanks, it's about 5 to 10 ppm a week. And again, if, if I know I'm adding 5 to 10 ppm per week, like I know I'm feeding the corals very directly. So I don't really care if it's zero or it's five. Like I know it's being put into the system. I just don't want it to bottom out. What, what I'm about much done trying to chase my nutrients, you know, because they just keep bottoming out. You know, we had such a big problem with the nutrients until we put the scrubbers on our aquarium or on the main on the main system. And now we've incorporated them on almost every single system in our farm. 
And, you know, I used to have a big problem with, you know, the phosphates, you know, they were always above, you know, 0.1, 0.2. And it was a big problem because of the algae issues. And, you know, if anybody knows about 30,000 frag plugs and you got to scrub algae off them, it was a royal pain in the rear end. Did you see this company in Taiwan who put together a machine to clean frag plugs? It was just a concept. They didn't build it. but There's just like a a school project or something. I'm like, like, uh, yeah, if you need a robot, you might not be doing it right. Put a scrubber on, put a scrubber on your tank and you won't have to worry about it anymore. Literally anything else. Lots of fish. I mean, we have what? In the, there's farm tanks in the back. There's, you know, 30 tangs in each one, and they're constantly picking and cleaning, you know. But chasing and trying to get rid of my nutrient levels, you know, I, there for the longest time when we did strip the nutrients with the scrubbers, you know, after we got the traces balanced back out, you know, we were we were doing exactly like you were saying. We were putting, you know, putting dosing nitrates. So I was dosing enough nitrates, which is about 50 mLs of calcium nitrate in the farm system, and I'd put it in in the morning. And I'd test it in the afternoon and be like, well, did I even dose it? Did I forget? Did I do it? Did I do it? (laughs) You know, so then I would do it again before I left. And I'd come in in the morning and be like, well, what the heck is going on here? You know, we we had, you know, with with the scrubber and the corals and, you know, the the, the amount of algae that does grow that the tangs take care of and, you know, the, the snails, you know, the nutrients and I'm just learning not to mess around with them. And if I do bottom out on, say, the phosphate side of it, I end up just, you know, going back to my old method of getting phosphates back into my aquarium and doing a good mix of different types of food with the Captivate food, a little bit of reefroids, a little bit of, uh, you know, callinus or whatnot. And, you know, I can I can raise my phosphate levels literally within a 24-hour period of time just by putting the right right uh, foods in the system to, to make sure that I get it back so that, you know, there is something there. But a lot of times we read them and they're 0.03 for phosphates and nitrates never read anything. Even on the eye dip, they're zero. It says low every single time. What about um, the use of bacteria, dosing bacteria to, you know, help along a system and to help control nitrates and phosphates? A lot of folks, uh, you know, you, you, you no. see are using Brightwell's Microbacter 7. You know, there's Microbacter uh, Clean from Brightwell that's out there. Is there any difference between those products? I'm just curious. I think there's I'm just, a, I'm just, I'm just going to say no. Uh, I know that's it. not really popular. Well, it's not that. I believe in bacteria. I really believe in bacteria. I believe they really don't need our help. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So like, you don't I believe think, in you don't bacteria. Think, you don't think a boost is uh, necessary? Um, oh. There's a case to be made that some older tanks, the the, the bacterial population distribution can get skewed towards um, more of the heterotrophic versus autotrophic uh, strains, right? Like red slime algae. So there, I think there's some cases to be made for uh, pulses. If you're starting up a new tank, yeah, start, you know, throw in some XLM, you know, especially for a fish tank, you want to, you know, con- convert the, the ammonia to nitrate. But, you know, over the years, like, I don't even think about it. Like, oh, well, I will also set up a tank with well, I have a bunch of corals. That is my seed. And, you know, even my fish tank, I have like, I have like a 150 gallon tank. I have this much biomedia in it. Like, you know, just a fistful because I believe in bacteria, right? I believe in bacteria so much. They don't need our help. They don't need a freaking five gallon yeah, pail. I was literally talking to someone earlier today um, about how like it just, doesn't make any sense you see people with established reef tanks like good been going for years one or two three five years um they got their full fish population they got the full coral population they got the live rot they got all the sand they got the sump they got the ketomorpha reactor and they have the protein skimmer and just because it's on the shelf they'll buy you know a hundred dollars worth of biomedia like yeah. what do you think you're what do you think is going to happen <laughs> you know your tank's already well, established and thriving spend your money on your corals yeah or just 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 watch it. Just watch your tank. I believe in bacteria so much that I don't feel the need to help them out. They will grow on all the surfaces of the coral, every nook and cranny of, you know, the excess live rock that most people have in their reef tanks, um, in all your tubing, every surface of your sump, every, I mean, just, they they will grow everywhere. Unless you have a high fish load, you don't really need much of a dedicated place for bacteria to grow. I mean, do you think those, those biomedias, they come with an invitation says, Hey, bacteria come grow here. (laughs) Like, no, that's just not, that's not how it works. They're going to grow. They're going to grow. They don't care about what you put in the tank. Now, if you're cycling a tank for for a start, there are some great products out there. Um, If you want to export nutrients because you are a heavy handed frozen food feeder, 
um, then you might dose certain bacterias along with certain carbon sources to facilitate that nutrient export. But uh, me and Chris and definitely like a, um, a, a, the current generation of some of the older reefers, we're having problems with our nitrates not being there. <laughs> right. So <laughs> well, what else is there to do? You know, it's, it's funny you were talking about this because, um, you know, I, I kind of ran into a little bit of a dilemma this past weekend. Um, I got a massive Australian shipment in on Friday and I mixed up the dates when my Indonesian import was coming in. I thought it was coming in on Thursday this week and I got the surprise on Saturday morning. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> the shipment's coming Monday morning. And I literally stuffed the place full. There was not a place to put corals. So over the weekend, my wife and I were over at the farm and we literally ripped out our old fish packing table and threw in a brand new coral system. Um, on Saturday and Sunday, and then Monday we filled it up with water, and I grabbed two of the big green racks, you've seen them, Jake, that are full of corals, and just moved them from one existing system straight into the other system, and I'm not even concerned about it, because it's, it's a brand new system all the way around, except for that rack of corals that was in the existing system, and I stuffed this new system completely full of corals already, too, and I'm not even concerned that there's going to be any, any outbreaks or any issues or like ammonia buildup because like it you doesn't said, even cross our mind. No. Every reef show <laughs> you go to is a freshly set up tank packed full of corals. Do you think no, they have bacteria in their tanks? So, do you, I mean, do you so, see any problem with them? I, I do. When I go to a show like that to keep my tank clean, I always have preceded like biomedia that comes along that I put into the system. And that has been the key to my success for my tanks being crystal clear, except for with the exception of Aquashella this year with the uh, alcohol clouds going into the air and carbon dosing my system all, all the whole time it, I was there. It kind of built out a little bit. But You um, should not be dosing bacteria because. You should no. have a reason. Either exactly. you're starting up a tank mostly for fish, or you really need to export some nutrients, or you want to combat some cyanobacteria growth, or you want to minimize some of the biofilm accumulation on your rocks. Don't don't do this because like bacteria, they don't need your help, man. I've been here for like four and a half billion years. Billion years. They exactly. know what to do. <laughs> You're exactly right. They're I specific. Mean, there's very specific applications for bacterial additives and bacterial foods. Um, but unless you're really targeting those, just like don't. Don't do that. There's a, there's a lot of products on the market that definitely will work and, and, and be extremely um, good for a new hobbyist, especially what Jake was saying with the – with a fish system, I mean, you you have to you have to see that. There's nothing you can do. Um, yeah, you, that bacteria uh, has you, to come you, from you, somewhere. You have to do it for a fish system, but for a coral system, every piece of coral that you come that you get, especially if you're, you know, like we when we import corals, we get chunks of live rock on our soft corals. Well, because there's bacteria all over that right there. I mean, that's <laughs> you put that in your system. There's already bacteria on there, and it maybe been hurt from shipping. But it doesn't take long. Bacteria is very resilient. It's like Jake said, it's been around for four and a half billion years, and um, there's not much we can do to to help it out. Really, it's just it's going to do what it's going to do, no matter what, um, unless you put in chemicals in your aquarium that are actually killing it. Um, I think you know, in the future, there. there might be some um, prophylactic strains of bacteria that we can add to our tanks that will reduce. Um, instances of some kinds of you know tissue necrosis or brown jelly. We, we're not there yet. Um, I'm not going to give too many shout outs, but um, Aquabiomics is basically the ICP of um, bacterial uh, distribution and populations in your reef tanks. And we're just yes. scratching the surface, man. You know, I got a, I got, a, I had this interesting, uh, not a, not a, a problem, but just as a scenario where, in my fish quarantine conditioning system, which runs you know normal seventy six to seventy seven Fahrenheit, um, that you know I was wiping down the, the the diatoms quite often, and I had to do that on my fish tank um, a lot also, and um, I got a, a cover for it, which kept the tank you know very sealed so it wasn't you know cooling off. And uh, the first summer here that the fish display was here, um, the the temperatures just you know kind of got up 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 to about eighty degrees, and then all of a sudden I noticed that like I didn't have to wipe down the tank. I mean, I'm not. I mean, there'd be little patches, but it wasn't like every like twice a week where there's just like this crazy diatom film. And for me, that was a fun opportunity to take some samples from the fish uh, fish quarantine system and the fish display and compare. So uh, there's a there's a lot more to learn, I think, about bacteria and what they do in our reef tanks. But we just don't have the tools or the knowledge. I mean, Aquabiomics is doing this. Um, I think uh, that's going to be a really big service. 
but we just don't, I don't, I mean, even with my background in marine science and biology and ecology, like I, I don't, I don't know how to tease apart the results. So, so I literally just got my phone and be like, yo, explain this to me. So when I had Mike Paletta on a couple of weeks ago, he, we talked about that, you know, and he, he does dose MV7. And I think, um, you know, the reason why is because he was having a lot of, um, you know, STN, RTN type of issues. So what he wanted to um, be able to do was stay on top of, you know, having a, uh, a proportionally a, a larger amount of the good bacteria versus the bad bacteria. And that's, I think, how he got the read on that by doing the, that kind of test, which apparently is not that expensive to do. So, um, so I, I know, I know, I know, Mike, you know, he's uh He's very much a fish forward guy. He loves his corals, but he's always got a very generous uh, population of fish. And he's, you know, a classical feeder, which probably has frozen food uh, dabbling into the tank every, you know, several times throughout every day. And uh, that all that extra food, that's what fuels um, uh, excess bacterial growth and populations. And that's what he's going to fuel some of the good bacteria versus the bad bacteria. And so what he's doing with MB7, Microbacter 7, is exactly what I'm saying is there's some, some use cases where you can add, um, you know, beneficial strains of bacteria to help process whatever's going on in your tank and outcompete um, the kinds of bacteria that are going to stimulate um, recession in certain groups of corals. When so yeah, about, Michael, Michael Paletta's tank and, and use case scenario is a perfect example. When you're talking about like bacterial, you know, like STN, RTN, I mean, it's not just bacteria that's causing it. It's, we're talking about, you know, the ciliates that live in the, in the system. It's that a microbial our, you know, community. Like, Exactly. So, you know, when you have an imbalance in them is usually what happens and usually what causes, you know, the STN or the RTN to start is when one is, you know, they live in harmony together in most cases, when say a coral gets stressed out and the bacteria gets in there, then the ciliates are like, oh, it's time to start feeding and they start, mm -hmm. you know, just ripping the coral apart. So it's not just bacteria. There's so many things that nobody can really explain exactly what causes all of this stuff and how are you going to keep that from happening? You know, you know, when you're talking about these bacteria and, you know, the, you know, um, the different strains that are living in an aquarium, uh, something that I haven't done and I have, I've had these kits in my possession now since I think October DNA kits so that I can go in and swab the insides of my, uh, of my pipes for my system. That's been running now with the, at the farm now for uh, nine years. And, uh, Gene gave them to me. He's like, dude, you got to go in there and swab these and, t and send this in. So you can see how many different strains of bacteria you actually have living in your system with this DNA test kit. I'm actually very curious, and um, I'm glad we're talking about this tonight because it's actually really kicking me in the gear to go actually get that done so I can see how many different strains and species of uh, bacteria actually live inside my system over almost a decade of um, being up and running and established. It's I, I, I do want to make it clear, though, that we're talking about fringe stuff, and there's some yeah. use cases – but again, 99.9% .9 of people with I saltwater aquariums and reef tanks, just let them be, you know, let just, them be. Have, just have like good, you know, uh, reef keeping or aquarium keeping practices. You don't have to worry about the stuff what, that we're talking what about. about um, yeah. what, what about though for um, dinoflagellates? So, so Chris, you mentioned, you know, dosing iron to, iron. to, uh, to help solve that issue. But a lot of folks you, um, you know, you, you hear about that are fighting the dinos dose the MB7 to help build up that um, bacteria population, I guess, to outcompete I mean, the, uh, the dinos. The bacteria is already there, Keith. Keith, the bacteria most likely is already there. It's this, just that there's just there's a reason why it's it's not actually taking care of the dinoflagellates. And it's iron. I'm, I'm a firm believer in this. I mean, I've done this more than once now. The first time I did it was when Gene called me and said he had dinos outbreak and i said like, listen i got the same problem we're doing exactly the same method this is the guy that does the icps for me and he did a quick run and found out that his iron was literally at like one part per billion in his system and he's like whoa and he runs an algae scrubber like i do almost identical but on a much like 10 times smaller scale uh for the size of his system and the dinos were there and he realized that the iron level was so low didn't think anything of it he dosed enough iron to get it to natural seawater levels, and he was gone until Sunday. And when he came back, he told me that the whole entire smell of his office, where the tank's main sump is, was different. It didn't have the same smell to it. And he looked at his tank, and he's like, it was crystal clear. There was not a bit of dinoflagellates anywhere in the entire system. No bubbles, no nothing. And the only thing he did was dose iron before he left. And as soon as he told me that um, – my system is quite large, and for me to add um, 
iron to it. I had to add an entire bottle of Julian Sprung's, um, what is it, the, the iron manganese supplement, which would take it from zero to natural seawater levels, 500 mLs of it. I put it in. Within 48 hours, I had literally had zero bubbles left in the entire system. There was no dinoflagellates anywhere to be seen. And it was like my tank had been totally transformed from this, you know, disgusting looking bubbly algae brownies look to it to you could see all the coralline algae again. You could see all the subtle algaes growing on that's on the, uh, the tiles. And it was just dosing iron. And so, I don't want to talk about dinos forever because there's much more interesting things to talk there about. Is, but but I think I could put a good pin in it. You know, um, dinoflagellates is a new problem. Mm. Our tanks used to run a minimum of like 78 degrees. If you had metal halides, 82, 84, 86, that was normal. And if you go out to tropical reefs, oh, well, yeah, in the shallows, that's what it is. You know, okay. so this is a modern phenomenon. And I think the, the, the pool of evidence suggests that we've had a microbial community shift because that temperature is pushed downwards. The dinoflagellates are better able to grow in that condition. And iron is also one of those things that helps to shift the balance. There's already some really good um, kind of verified uh, observations, not freaking peer reviewed paper that's verified by science right but like uh, observations by very experienced reefers that raising your temperature or just dosing some iron i don't even think you need to hit natural seawater levels because i no. saw results by just dosing yeah. some no i you're shifting the balance you don't need even need to understand it all the way right that's a that's right. a whole phd thesis on its own just try one of these two things and stop pulling your hair out and, the, and I, uh, one, I, one thing i don't know about microbacter seven but if <clears> if it it really worked. Like, here's the thing about Microbacter 7. If you if you dose Microbacter 7 or comparable bacterial additives, it might work for a little bit. But if your temperature is still low or your iron is still low, it's just going to shift back, right? So Microbacter 7 or comparable products might be able to speed things up. But as Gene and Chris and myself have, have witnessed, without much effort, a little iron seems to just be the, <clears throat> that magic bullet. And it's it's a lot less expensive to dose a little bit of iron than it is to continue to continuously dose a, you know a bacterial supplement because they can end up getting expensive. I used to dose bacterial supplements every single time we got a coral. Dude, I used to, because... I used to be addicted to Prodibio, man. I would add that stuff all the time. <laughs> you know, Bioptim and BioDigest. I was just like, oh yeah, oh yeah, go for it. And then over time, I just kind of stopped because my I didn't and have enough changed. nutrients in the tank. But, and nothing changed. Let me uh, let me say one more thing about the dinos. I had a huge outbreak in my new uh, Peninsula tank, and the way I got rid of them was a uh, uv you know and and i think i was I was, I was fortunate because they I were the uh the free floating type of um dinos that um I was that'll work but that's not shifting your microbiome right exactly. that's just whittling it down to the point where it's no longer a problem but your uv lamp is gonna you know wear out right it's a fluorescent lamp without any fluorescent phosphors in there and yep. just over time it's gonna die out over time it's gonna scum is also gonna build up on it and your uh you know uv germicidal uh, rays are just gonna go down 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 so left unchecked your temperature's still low your iron's still low um you should expect to, for that to come back in i don't know six eight nine months uh you know unless you're fortunate enough to have your microbiome um naturally shift in a general direction that precludes yeah i mean i would think because it's a young tank that um perhaps that will um you know of course correct itself over time when it matures you know what about using a uv 24 7 on a uh on a reef tank what are you guys thoughts on that i just started doing it i mean i i was i was against it for a long time but then after i started thinking about it and i was like well if i don't run both my return lines from my sump into my main coral runs if i don't run both of them through a uv i'm not killing everything that's going through the uv or going through the 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 return lines through a uv sterilizer and you're i mean when the system is super healthy you're going to have an overabundance of of uh bacteria you're gonna have an overabundance of um, my son's uh, waving hello <laughs> you're gonna have an overabundance of um basically uh, microfauna in your tank and, you know, having a little UV going, you know, to help with some of the, maybe the bad bacteria or the non-beneficial bacteria that could be, you know, in your system. I haven't noticed any benefits from using a UV as of yet because it's on my new farm system, except for the fact that when it turned into a, 
uh, phytoplankton garden, the UV took about five days for it to completely clear it up. Um, that was the only reason why I actually put it on there to start with. And now I'm just like, you know, let's keep give it a try and see what happens because I don't think it can be any, any um, downfall to it because if there is something going through your system that is not, that is a negative bacteria, um, at least you can help keep it under control versus adding something else that would be um, less natural um, for controlling it and, you know, have less issues with these, uh, you know, possible, uh, bacteria getting in and, and affecting, especially in, on us, for us, our farm, which is our prized possessions, which is Again, the future w- of our industry. You know, I would like to emphasize that Chris is a commercial coral dealer, handler, propagator, right? He's not only culturing his corals he's getting new corals and 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 vectors for introducing potential pathogens all the time if i ran a commercial facility i would probably have about 50 watts of uv per 200 gallon tank i but for a general hobbyist there's about three reasons that you really need a uv right don't 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 get a uv because what if right you should be right. kind of conditioning and, and, and quarantining and isolating your stuff before it's to your tank that's not going to save you right it's not exactly. even going to be a parachute exactly. it might slow things down but there's three reasons uh, one i have i have a i have a 15 watt uv sterilizer and a 120 watt sterilizer and they're on the shelf because periodically i'll pull them out and just use use them for something every yep. spring my freshwater tank gets green water and i'll pop it on there for you know, about a week or two get rid of it um, if you have a fish tank that maybe has a little bit of person sit ick or or reef system that has ick that you just can't beat back. That's the other thing that it's for. Exactly. Or and, and then the only real sort of tangible benefit that you might have from having a UV on a, the display reef aquarium is reducing the amount of algae grown on your glass. Because when you wipe that stuff off, exactly. It, it it's has to go through the water to hit the glass again, <laughs> but it's not going to eliminate the need to clean the glass. So if you are a service company and you want your customer's glass to stay as clean as possible for as long UV as possible, sterilizer. that's a good opportunity to put a UV sterilizer. And that's one of those cases. If you, again, if you have a professional, um, uh, a commercial account and you need to, you know, to never have any issues, that's one of those good use cases, but general reefing, it's not going to hurt or help. If anything, it's probably going to help you take more just from the effect of warming up your water. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Also creates a little ozone. So, uh, Which I want to, I want to, um, take one more chemistry question from the audience and then kind of shift gears a little bit. I know Jake, you love livestock. I know you, I know you love the uh, yes. talk on livestock here. <laughs> Unless you want to talk about some specific reef gear, especially some new stuff. <laughs> I'm always down for yeah. that. I could do that as well. Um, what do you guys think about um, carbon dosing with vodka? Have you ever done it? Specific I applications. It I, I, specific I, applications. If you, we, we just, we started this entire conversation about talking about how we have to add nitrates to our tanks. Right. I, so one of the things about carbon dosing is what kind of bacteria are you fueling? Exactly. Right. And you you know, might be it's... fueling that Vibrio. <laughs> you might be fueling that, that STN. You might be fueling your brown jelly. Don't just carbon dose. Cause you think it sounds cool. You it know, the it's only natural. case where I have seen some awesome benefits from, from carbon dosing, is there's been a couple times where I've set up what I, what was going to be a very bright light, very high energy Acropora tank. And I ran the tank with carbon dosing for like months before putting any corals. I put one little canary in the coal mine in there, just, you know, just see what's going on. And I run it for, for months. And man, that is one of those few cases where no matter what I added to the tank, there was never any algae. There was never any algae. I mean, just a little <laughs> white dusting on the glass. So, um, you know, don't do carbon dosing because it's cool. And, you know, a couple of these acro tanks, they're on YouTube and they're they're old now. So look out for that 320, 480p that, the limit that YouTube <laughs> used to have. Um, the only thing that grew in that tank, because I had sort of sterilized it from nutrients because I was literally putting like a shot of vodka in there every few days, <laughs> was maiden's hair. It's called maiden's hair algae, but it's not an algae. It's actually a green plant. And it's exactly. the only thing that could actually grow in the tank. It's kind of funny. You know, uh, carbon dosing, I did it, you know, uh, I don't know, over a decade ago. I used a lot of carbon dosing. And, you know, I've always been trying to refine how I reef, and um, especially on the scale that we're doing it on. And uh, carbon dosing is just another thing you got to do every single day. Why, why, why do it when you can put a 
put an algae scrubber on your tank if you don't want any nutrients in your aquarium. And trust me, that will take care of your problem in dose and trace elements every single day. And you won't have to worry about your nutrients. I mean, my, my nutrient levels like – Dosing, dosing vodka or dosing sugar or whatever these carbon dosings, you know, what the, the popular thing is to do. It's, it's just like that. Like I said, it's a popular thing to do. There's no reason for you to do it. If you are going to spend your money on dosing vodka to your aquarium every single day, if you dose, you know, five fifths of vodka in a year, you could have bought yourself an algae scrubber um, unless you're using the cheapest vodka on the market. Um, but you know, once again, it's, it's all about this. what you're doing. And your application. Sorry to interrupt exactly. you. Exactly. No, it's you're, all about you're exactly your application. Right. Like, what are you doing? Like, don't just carbon dose because you think the, the the where it makes the most sense to dose carbon is on a fish aquarium a display. Fish Raise system. your hand if you have a <laughs> fish aquarium display. Like, I have one, but I don't not dose me. it in there because I've tr I mean I've tried them all. It's not, it's not for me. I've seen some some cases where it works, especially commercial scale aquaculture. Like I've seen tanks just crazy packed with 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 clownfish, and they were using carbon dosing because they had so many fish in such a small volume that they really really needed it. But one of the reasons that I am not a crazy fan of carbon dosing is that biofilm goes everywhere. Yep. The biofilm everywhere. goes everywhere. everywhere. It goes on your, you know, in your skimmer, on your pumps, uh, you know, rotor shaft, on your needle wheel. And I've already, I've already asked people if they ever clean their stuff. And most people don't. They just let it break and then they just get new stuff. Like, I'm this is really upsetting. So I'm not going to go there, you know? And so, like, don't do carbon dosing unless you really understand what is going to happen. It is not only going to remove your phosphates and nitrates. It can cause major problems for people too. I mean, it can, it can, yeah. you know, you can, you can overdo it to the point where, you, you know, things start going south in your system and you know, oh, I'm carbon dosing. Well, that's the reason why everything's going bad because your the bacteria population has gotten so high that, you know, you're, you're removing every last bit of nutrient that can be in the water. What's going to happen over time with that? You're not going to have algae growth. What's, what's most important part of a coral algae here, here, in the tissue. If you kill that algae, you're going to bleach them out. That'll be scary. <clears throat> when biopels first came out, we didn't oh, even God. understand how much to use. And I would use what I thought was a small amount on my fish display. I had biofilms on my fish. Yeah. Dude. I'm not even kidding. Like, you know, they have a certain amount of slime, right? And you, if you catch it at the right angle, you can see that there's, you know, it's not just scales. There's a little lay on there. And when I was oh, dosing, right. again, we didn't, we didn't really know what we were doing. Almost just like and velvet. It, it was just, they looked thick <laughs> you know they just it just looked like a, they looked, the fish looked a little blurry and it was weird hey, it was working and so uh, once again this is one of those use case scenarios where it makes a lot more sense for commercial applications and one of the only times i've seen bio pellets used on a reef aquarium display was at surface accounts right because the 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 customer they they don't know how much to feed so they can just be heavy-handed and the tanks got a little bit of birth actually the the tanks that i've seen was by a local company called uh, premier fish and reef i used to work with will we went and visited a bunch of tanks and he had like this much bio pellets in a bioreactor and he also yes. had um vodka uh, vinegar sugar vsv um small amount also dosing the tank because the customers you know they didn't know about reef tanks so they would just feed whatever they want and that just helped him keep things in line so that makes perfect sense you know we had i had a, cu um, a customer here in tampa that was using uh, when bio pellets came out and uh they they put the bio pellet reactors, which um, we ended up buying from him a couple of years later after he realized that they were just uh, not worth it for a reef aquarium. I mean, he would have every about every four to six months, his he would come in in the morning and his entire tank would be milk white because he had this massive bacterial bloom. And then he, he was an acro freak, so his tank, his sticks would end up, you know, starting RTN. He would lose color. He would have just major issues. And after I think the fourth bacterial bloom. He decided he was done. He was taking the Why did it take four times? <laughs> um, because, you know, he kept reducing the amount of bio pellets that he had in there, thinking that it would actually do some, be, be, be very beneficial. Because, uh, you know, the application back in the beginning was, I thought, very, very good, you know. But when you break it down, like we were talking about bacteria earlier, it's going to find a way. It's going to find it. Every surface that's in your, you know, the pipes, every single piece of surface area in your system is going to have bacteria on it. So before, you know, I kept saying it. You need to get those bio pellet reactors off your system. You have like what, 500 pounds of rock in a thousand gallon tank. You've got enough surface area. You don't need your bio pellet reactors. Even if you have a ton of fish, you're feeding a lot. You have this massive protein skimmer on there. You're not having any major issues. 
excuse. There's no reason for you to have it on there. Well, finally, when he got rid of them, I converted them into fluidized bed filters for my fish systems when I had yeah. fish. <laughs> and, you know, we, we've, we've got, again, back to the fundamentals. People yeah. see other people doing stuff, and they think that's the way to Trendy. do it. And they won't even, like... Do Research a few it. Google searches to verify what they've seen. When biopellets were first introduced, it was clear that you had to have a protein skimmer, right? Yeah. And I'm sure everybody's got a protein skimmer, but back then we placed special emphasis on having the outlet from the, your biopellet reactor going into an aggressive protein skimmer, which would reduce the biofilming going throughout your tank. Now, another application I can see where uh, biopellets or carbon dosing would be really advantageous is if you're someone like Jamie Craggs and you're really trying to roid up your corals with a lot of food and that food is going everywhere. You know, you can't just target, you know, every single tiny polyp. So you have to broadcast feed. That's one of those cases where you would, again, you would have a much wider berth and let the bacteria consume the nutrients, get the carbon that they need, but feed that outflow directly into an aggressive protein skimmer, right? Yep. Are these, these fundamentals, people think they know, but they don't know. <laughs> that's that's the, kind of like one of the system, systemic types of uh, issues that we're dealing with this day and age in terms of the uh, social media reef keeping forums. There's just so much information out there, and there's just so many people that will uh, kind of go and pontificate and, um, you know, sometimes you've got folks that haven't been in the hobby for that long that will kind of got a name for them. What's that? DK reefers. DK reefers. Oh, okay. Dunning Kruger reefers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, I actually stopped going on any forums. You know, I, I look at things once in a while and if somebody tags me in something, I'll go take a look at it. But I've, I've learned that I am not going to be commenting on anything anymore because I don't have the time or the effort to go in and explain the reason why I, I make the comments that I do. There's everybody, no point in that conversation. Everybody's an expert. We've been on the in all, collectively on the internet, you know, mostly about 20, 25 years, right? There's almost never, virtually never been a point where you have explained yourself until your fingers were bleeding <laughs> and someone said, oh, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I think you're yeah. right. You actually changed my mind. No, People don't exactly do that right. online. No, they don't. I mean, everybody, it's, it's a different story when you're, when you're talking like we are here or you're face to face with somebody, when somebody's behind that keyboards, for some reason, you things know, you, it doesn't matter what you say. Yeah. Things change. And, um, that's why I learned to just, um, yeah, I got I call, myself I call in, them D, DK reefers or, or newbie <laughs> experts. Hey, John Reefer, Vermont, John Reefer, Vermont. Thank you so much for that super chat. And the comment is my tuition fee before Jake Adams yells at me. And I'm, I, I believe uh, that was from the last time you were on Jake. <laughs> Encouraging everybody to uh, contribute with the super chat. So thanks, John. Yeah, you guys need to. You know, it, it takes a lot of work to put these these um, these meetings online and a lot of energy, and we have to interrupt our our, our schedules. And uh, Keith is paying us a lot of money, so make sure <laughs> to drop a lot in the super chat Zero. and let him know that Keith um, it was money well spent. <laughs> thanks, dude. Uh, you know it's. It's, it's fun. I enjoy getting on here and having these kind of conversations. You know what we do with that money? You know, when you give us some super chats, well, you know what Keith does with that money? He's just going to buy some super glue. He's going to buy some beer. No, We're just going to drink it, right? We're it's not going to go money. gambling get some or, or exactly. buy drugs or pay for hookers, right? Just <laughs> show him some appreciation. Speaking so of, I'm, I'm low. It's, it's not about the money. It's more like gamification. I might, I might this... have to text for some more beer, you know? I, I, I'm running <laughs> nowhere. I think I'm going to have to text somebody here soon. Is oh, dude, I was I thinking the same thing. I already got two. Hey, uh, honey, if you're listening, I think I need another uh, beer. So. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, when you, when you drop the super chat, man, it's not about about the money it's it's just one of the ways that you can show your support for whoever is producing whatever live stream you're putting on together keith has not been doing this for a few days not been doing this a few weeks i will you know i've watched you know there's there are some really great interviews with you know lots of different points of view if you want to vaccinate yourself against the dunning kruger effect first of all <laughs> google it so you know what that is and then go back and listen to a handful of different interviews from keith at reef bum and um, it's going to round out your perspective so thanks man I really that's my plug I, for keith while we're on here i appreciate it and, and sure. uh, telegram <laughs> thanks for the super chat there and and uh, right back at you jake you know the like i mentioned at the beginning of the show the uh, the reef therapy is um just an awesome way to just kind of kick fun. back and listen to a couple of guys talk on reef you guys do an incredible job so um you're definitely i'm behind the eight ball here dude i am i feel <laughs> a little bit of sadness everyone every time someone tells me 
how much they enjoy reef therapy because I don't get to listen to it. <laughs> when are you going? <laughs> like, when, are you, wish, when are you guys doing it live? I wish other people were, you know, just taking some critical looks at more stuff and keeping like I think you've noticed like the conversation has been varied ideas and details from you know a lot of observation experience um so yeah i just i wish i could listen to reef therapy so if if you, you want some some, I, some meaty servings of reef thoughts go take it give it a look thanks uh Luis, for that super chat here's mine uh at jake the kids will drop off your super chat at aquatic heart i guess you uh you understand <laughs> that i don't um what was I going to uh, go into? Oh, yeah, let's let's go back to talking about corals. So, Jake, you recently posted yes. an article on uh, big changes coming to nope. Australian nope, coral. Nope, nope. We don't I don't want to go there. We're not talking about that. Today. Well, no, no, it's it's exhausting <laughs> as a journalist trying to keep up with the the yo-yo of regulations in Indonesia and in Australia. And I'm not trying to shut you down. It's just it really takes a lot out of me. Uh, all the details that I know on reef builders, it, it, that's the that's the fine tooth comb. This just, just go read that. I put one up today that literally just copied and pasted the email that Chris sent me because I'm just, <laughs> just so mentally well, tiring. Chris, to do, you want to, uh, try to... do you want to talk uh, at all about that? I mean, I, I'm going to make it really brief. Um, you know, it, when, when Jake and I talked about it last week and, um, you know, he was talking about putting something up, um, I, I was, you know, I was like, man, I hope I don't get something here soon about it, you know, something being different than what I knew from a, a very good direct source from uh from australia and literally on friday the day after he put his article out i'm talking to him on the phone and i'm like hey i just got a message um <laughs> here, here's the deal now and he's like great <laughs> i mean things change constantly and um i think just everybody needs to understand that you know in uh we we have until october 30th easy Read Jake's they're, article. They're going to sort out. it out. I would call it a yeah. non-issue. Exactly. It, it, at the, over non-issue. here, it's just not going to matter. Um, okay. if, if you like corals, just buy corals that you like and don't exactly. worry about what's happening over on the in, you know, commercial we, side of things. We, we, we on the commercial side of importing corals and then farming corals, of course, we were a little bit nervous about it because we didn't know exactly the uncertainties and what was going to go on. So, um, you know, again, I installed a brand new thousand gallon coral system to continue to just bring in as much as possible so um that you know it, it also feeds my addictions which is um not a, I, not a problem whatsoever <laughs> i got a great sense yeah and this is a hard plug for solomon island corals I we have don't... had some crazy uncertainties with F- fiji shut down like a few months before i set up the studio man i could have filled up two tanks <laughs> for like 500 dollars of fiji corals i know and and <laughs> I just I, it's not about the money, but I miss those classic strains we already talked about. But Solomon Islands is a bright spot because it took a long time to get things sort of open, and there's never going to be a deluge of of just availability. Um, but they are what? just one thing that you can know about Solomon Island corals. It's not you know first world folks that can afford a half million dollar boat. And uh, two thousand dollars worth of you know petrol to get out to the outer reefs and all the permits and all their licenses. When you buy Solomon Island corals through Unique Corals, for now they they you know they still have a very small spigot coming through. Uh, yes, I know, Chris. I'm going to get there. Um, <laughs> you have a certain degree of confidence that there's people who live on the coral reefs who are making a living sustainably harvesting and farming corals in the Solomon Islands. Right. So right now. There's very limited supply. We still have COVID, COVID logistics in terms of price and in terms of just sheer cargo space. So, but I know in times a few select dealers, um, you know, if Chris jumps through the right hoops, maybe he'll be in it. <laughs> um, I already but, had the conversation but, last week. Uh, okay, so 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 yeah. Just I would, instead of talking about the stuff that's shutting down, I think it'd be awesome to talk about the stuff that's opening up. Um, okay. Very few people know that our hobby was built like like Fiji has oceanic Pacific oceanic corals right and the first place we got any kind of significant diversity from especially like all your rainbows all of your torts oh my god you go diving in Solomon Islands there's torts and millies freaking everywhere yes. and, and Monopora Monasteriata everywhere all that stuff was uh, Bob Mencken Solomon Island coral farms those we, they, were, they, they were little frags on the specific discs with I remember two poles. that first started coming in 1999 those are the first like commercially produced frags so that's a, that's a really cool ray of sunshine you know uh, it's 
Solomon Islands is a big place, right? And so uh, Tim and myself are going to have to go back and do a lot more exploration. But over the last couple of weeks, they have succeeded in bringing in some amazing colonies of uh, various lobophilia and what used to be called symphilia and then acros, you know, um, mostly millies, man. You, when you're out there. And the some cool chalices, too. Uh, yeah, no, in the past, in certain locations, we have, you know, every rainbow chalice you can think of, um, a lot of those have their roots, originally came from the Solomon Islands. Um, the Magic Musa, man, that was an Australia Musa, now na- na- Lobo, that was like a literal rainbow, but it was a single Coralite. And it just absolutely a- a- astonishing. So many Cinerinos there. So um, as. I got one uh, in you got one way. I, I, I got, got one Cinerino? Really... No, got no, one? no. Oh no! Was, I got like was it from the Solomon's? I got, I got like half a dozen Cinerinos last night, but I mean, I got an Australia Musa or a, a Lobophilia or a, what is it? A Periscolemia, whatever. We they should do, just call them Rollies. I think that we should call them good. Rollies because it was like called Australia Musa <laughs> Rolliensis. Yep. They they won't change the chi- the species name. They will only change the it's genus the name, genus. which is kind of cool. Um, yes. So it was Australia Musa. And then some scientists scientists didn't know how to line up Australomusa and uh, uh, Scalemia vicensis, and so they lumped it up into Periscalemia, oh, and back. now it's back down to freaking Lobophilia, and so we just need to go back to the species names. So this is one of the yep. place, places where the French and the Australians have it right, because in France, a yellow tang is called a flav. Flav? A, yeah. Scientific name. Super Soma flavescence. Makes sense. Makes perfect um, sense. A, a powder blue tang is called a luco. A cantharis okay. leucosternin. Right, so you can have these funny pet names without making shit up. I'm sorry, I just had to say that like that. I'm all, I am in Australia, you. torch corals are called glabs, hmm? euphilia glabrescens, and acanthophilias are called deshies. Acanthophilia deshi deshiasiarnia. So the name, the, that's one name. I, the name <laughs> game is not going on over there. Well, um, it's like it's it it's an amalgamation of the real Latin name that's been just mm-hmm. kind of colloquialized, like Flavs, mm-hmm. Lucos, Glabs, and Deshies. Like, you're not going to so, call a Cinerina a Deshi. You know, right? You're not going to call a Hammer a Glab. I'm so, <laughs> tired sound of, retarded. I'm so tired of a new release coming up on the farm and us standing around and looking at, like, five of us going around, okay, what are we going to name this? What are we going to name this? What are we going to name this? What are we going to name it? You know, and it's like everybody's expecting a name from something that is, you know, and the only reason I want to put a name on any coral is because we literally farmed it. And I've got the, the data from when we started the frag, how many times we fragged that one frag and to get to, you know, a, you know, 50 to a hundred frags of this coral available and putting a name on it is like the hardest part for me. You know, I, I mean, I can farm a coral all day long, but when it comes to putting a name on it, sometimes it takes me two weeks to actually put a name on a coral because I can't think of a yes. name. I, I, didn't, I didn't name the mortal tort for five years. Dude, it was awesome. only after I'm, five years that I realized, Oh, that tort that kind of looks like a California tort that I collected from Solomon Islands in 2015. I figured out that didn't re- roll off the tongue and, and uh, I'd, I'd never lost one and I'd given it away to a bunch of people. And I was like, Hey, you know what? Mortal tort. That's kind of fun. Um, but I just want to wrap up with the Solomon thing before we dive in, into the names. Um, uh, this is one of those very rare instances where you can have such a direct impact on a supply chain because it's very artisanal. It's very, um, very much done by hand. So, you know, if you want to support the cause, look out for the Solomon Island corals. Unique corals is going to be one of the few places that has them for now. They have started wholesaling some of these colonies. But if you see Solomon Island corals, I want you to know that that means something different. And uh, that's my it, it, small commercial. Love you, Tim. Listen, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm all, I'm all with you on that, Jake, because you know, the, the these 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 uh, countries that are you know not first world countries they are third world countries you know they rely on first world countries like the United States and other countries around the world to um, allow these people to make a living off of the natural resources that they have and coral reefs are a natural resource that can be that can give and give and give and give and give if you do things properly and you know. Jake made a great point. You know, these people, they don't, they don't have a boat that costs them, you know, a half a million dollars that they can ride out into the, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, like some of these guys in, in Australia and collect for two weeks straight and keep the corals happy and healthy on their boats. These guys go out on a little dugout canoe with a little freaking motor on the back with, uh, you know, a makeshift, um, you know, out or inboard motor um, to, to, to get them around or they're paddling. And, you know, they're making very little money on the corals that they actually collect and for us to be able to help them feed their families their tribes you know that's that's important i think you know and that's you know 
part of you know what Jake was saying about the Solomon Islands, what makes it very unique. I mean, Indonesia was kind of that way for a long time, but now it's becoming more and more modernized. You know, they have the internet and they have, you know, they, they, of course, prices are reflecting because of the fact that, you know, uh, when I started importing corals o- over a decade, um, well, almost a decade and a half ago now, um, you know, prices aren't what they used to be. I mean, used to pay between you know, average cost landed of a piece of coral was like $17 15 years ago. Now you're talking about $65 average landed cost, you know, for a wholesale price point so you got everything from below that and everything up above that which you know it's a huge difference and you know i don't think that they respect the corals as much i think they just look at the dollars that they're making but these people in the solomon islands they actually you know they they, without them and without the you know unique putting their farm over there and putting their collection facility over there they they wouldn't be you know able to support their tribes their family as as well as they are now and i think it's uh, great and commendable for what they've done so that's a great point uh chris so we lost uh jake perhaps he's on a pee break or maybe he's going to get another beer <laughs> i don't know but I, while while he's away let me uh thank some folks for the super chats uh Nabaha, sure. Shal, thank you very much reef and dive commented you guys are great sorry if i'm sometimes too over critical i think it's fine you know we enjoy the uh, critical's good yeah we, we enjoy the um the feedback and the conversation uh, a Meckley, this one is for you, Keith. Just sit back and have a beer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's that now? That was, your, that was uh, oh, yeah. Amanda. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, she just actually came in and got herself a drink. Um, my daughter, my, Amanda, came in and got me a beer, and then I texted you know, she's texting somebody for a beer, so I texted I got I to gotta do that. I got to do that right now. So. Uh, <laughs> Amanda brought me a beer, and then like three minutes later, Isabel comes walking in with a beer. So um, I just know now, just do a text message. I'll get myself a beer. <laughs> well, I would have done that, but I also had a piece. So there, so that was my. Little I number. thought so. I thought it was either peeing or beer, but uh... both. Both. <laughs> it was both. Yeah. Um, I'd I'd like to 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 point something out. <clears throat> it's it's really easy to point the finger at the vendors, the coral or the coral producers for the name game, but. As anyone who works in a store today oh, yeah. knows, or is at a reef show knows, the, the, the end What's user, the, the buyers, will walk around and ask you, what is that? And if you tell them, this is an Acropora cicale from Fiji collected at 10 meters of depth, they'll be like, huh? Oh. They're like, what? It doesn't have a funny name, and it's not a, a strain. You know, naming a coral, sometimes it has a sentimental value, right? Like, you know, when Chris and I, are, when you have a coral for a long time, the name just comes out organically. But... The, the end user, the consumers, they're the ones driving this, right? They are. If they demanded re, like cycloceris, like fungus to be actually labeled as cycloceris and, right. and, and lords not to be called acans or micromooses to be called microacans. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> Deep breath. There it's the consumers that are driving this. It's they are true. forcing the stores to come up with ridiculous names that tell you nothing about the coral. Coral names used to mean something, right? Like like Oregon Tory. We know what that coral is. It does Valley not Bird. get imported. Then if you have Oregon Tory in this tank or that tank, you can compare notes, right? Yep. And so, again, it's really easy to point the fingers at the people who are coming up with the names, but any coral vendor at the reef shows or at the retail stores will tell you the, the, you know, the, the wave of disappointment that washes over somebody's face when you tell them it's just a coral. Right. No, I mean, it, it's, it's so funny. You know, we, I get um, I get it all the time. You know, as a wholesaler, we, you know, importing wild corals. I do not. I'm with Jake on this. I don't believe in the name game thing. The only time I believe in it is if it's actually something that we farmed and I have lineage and I can back it up. That's the only time I think that it's proper to name a coral. Um, and I get people asking me, you know, hey, do you have any dragon soul torches? Do you have any, you know, New York Knicks torches? Do you have any of this torch? Do you have any of that torch? And, you know, there's only one that I will actually put the name on because it is just that badass. And that's the Holy Grail torch. And they're like my nemesis for imports because they do not travel well. If I get one and I, you know, have it up for sale, I'll call it the Holy Grail just because it is a very gorgeous, unique looking euphelia glabrescence. But in most cases, people won't even buy a regular on my frag list, a gold torch coral, unless I can tell them what name it is. And I say, well, then you should be buying from a hobbyist down the road or from a shop that actually has 
their names on all the corals because I can't keep up because this one here's got a subtle gold stripe different from this one here and this one's got a different name but you look at them from a distance and you can't tell the difference between them like we were talking about earlier you know from a distance you couldn't tell the difference between most of these different strains or names of gold torch you know but up close if you look at the details yeah there's subtle differences but is it enough to, to, to the claim issue. a name and to claim you know a thousand dollars for a single head no not in my opinion it's gotten so ridiculous Another problem is I bought my Dragon Soul as a Holy Grail. Later on down the road, some you know coral farmers with more clout and experience or, or, or just um, influence, they've renamed it. They renamed what was the Holy Grail, which I call the Orange Torch. They renamed that the Dragon Soul, and then they applied Holy Grail to something else. Yep. And... All of these holy grails that are coming in, none of them are the holy grail. Holy grail should mean something, right? Like it should have stuck to that. And in my, in my opinion, if you have a brown torch and you want to call it holy grail, it's all made up. Exactly. It's all made up. It doesn't it mean anything. Be a right? Because the name game has gotten so out of control, you have no idea what a New York Knicks torch is. <laughs> right? Because somebody would have bought it from somebody for who have bought it from somebody who said it was the Knicks. Or, or, or it soul. was the, the, the well again, my dragon soul, I saw I bought it as a holy grail like three I'll or four it. years ago and it just got renamed. And so it's like you want to sell any torch coral as a holy grail? I won't knock you. It's all made up anyway. Here's how bad it's gotten. I mean, to the point where in Indonesia, my supply line, when they, you know, label the, 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 on the packing list that I receive, when I have euphelia glabrescence permits, they label what the names of these freaking things are. So now it's gotten down to the actual, um, export line is naming these corals, what the U S market is calling these corals. So in turn, a coral that I used to get and used to sell relatively cheap, you know, um, when I would make fragments of them or colonies that we would sell for, you know, $80 for a five head colony of a gold torch coral from Indonesia. Now, if it's got a Holy Grail name on it, they want to charge you per head that kind of money. Per, per what? And, per head. Oh, per coral light. No, per coral light. Jake's right. You know, Coals, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm. I'm using it. I'm using it. You know, I'm, I'm so used to this. <laughs> but no, per coral light, they want to. They want to. They want to charge you per coral light. And if I have a 15 um, polyp piece come in, and it's considered a holy grail, that coral might cost me fifteen hundred dollars now instead of it used to cost me forty five or fifty dollars right, right. just so, because of the name game. You know, I just and went through this this long discussion with uh, my co-host Mark Vanderwall on reef therapy. I'm not trying to plug it, but I'm just like a little exhausted by this conversation. So if you okay, want to deep, done too. No, if you want to <laughs> deep dive into coral pricing or coral names, we have separate sessions of reef therapy um, discussing just that. I think I saw um, it. Yeah. It was good. It was very good. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll circle back to the point you made at the beginning, Jake, about this discussion in terms of the Oregon Blue Tort, in terms of some of these names make a lot of sense. You know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw out Greg Hiller's Aqua Delight. That makes a lot of sense. It was a coral that uh, I guess Greg uh, had, had found and, and uh, his name was attached to it. So it, it, it makes uh, perfect sense. You know, I think there's some things that make a lot of sense uh, intuitively and, and other things that it's just pure marketing. You know, Brock B here in the chat wants to put a counterpoint up about this so whole name game discussion. You know, why is the naming game so bad, question mark? It's, Consumers. it's the commercialization Consumers. of the hobby. It helps appeal to new reefers. The price gouging is ridiculous, but branding works and helps consumers differentiate. But not really. No, mean, not really. Because the same thing. coral... Can be from exactly. Mariculture Farm, Ten which is names. It, it will. First of all, these are coral farmers, right? They don't have one table or, or fifteen tables of thirty different, you know, euphelia glabrescens, right? They they have five or six, but then there's other vendors and other vendors that have their five or six, and they 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 buy from each other, they trade with each other, and they'll steal from each other because there's only so many great places to grow the you corals. Grow they'll just literally exactly. swim over there, grab a piece, and then that's their new brood stock. You know, it's exactly. like, it's not worth anything until you get the money for it. So, right. and the thing is, like, if you have a holy grail, let's just I have a I have a good kind of a 
pin to, to button this up and, and, and kind of a little fix for this. Like that same coral strain will be sent to Barry, Bob, Joe, Mary, Kelly, and just they will all come up with brand new names for them. Exactly. And so That's one of the things that we proposed in reef therapy is go back to when Australian lords were first available, right? There's B grade, A grade, premium, and ultra, right? Like we just need to just kind of come up with a system. All right, does your torch coral, ha is it colorful? Does it have colored tentacles? All right, that's one trait. Does it have colorful tips? Cool, that's another trait. Does it have two colors on the tentacles? All right, we step it up in grade. Does it have a colored mouth? Boom, it's a premium, right? So every time you add a color, and this is what they did with the, with the Lords when they first shipped out, they didn't give them a, a crazy name. And to this day, they're still like A grade, premium, and ultra because they don't collect what grades I anymore, right? That's how they're, they're being sold. And that makes so much more sense. It's so easy. So much it more sense. Yeah. And it's just so much less tiring than trying to keem up with these made up useless names that can change on a dime. So let's let's talk exactly. about you know go ahead Chris. I was gonna say you know we, we just got in you know a bunch of lords last Friday and you know my supply line you know they 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 label them you know um rainbow premium rainbow ultra a b and it makes it so nice and easy when they put the labels on the boxes because I actually I upgrade a lot of the stuff and I downgrade a lot of the stuff. So it's it's nice to see what the what what, what they're thinking it is. But that's how it's always been from the supply line, especially my supply line out of Australia. Now I had some other suppliers when, when Indonesia was not you know shipping corals and I was trying a whole bunch of different places out and they had you know their different ways of grading their corals and it got to be completely annoying because from one supplier to the next supplier, you know. Uh, the same color morph of Lord would be more expensive from this guy than it was from the other guy. And I just finally cut out everybody else and went back to the original people that I was using because it just was uh, much easier and more fair when it came to price. And they didn't get to this commercialized naming of the corals and the commercialized naming of the corals has affected all the way down to the collectors themselves. And rightfully so these guys are doing the work to go collect these things, but at the same time, no, you can't blame them, but there is good people out there that don't agree with all this commercializing and the name game, and they're the people that I've been sticking with, and they're the most consistent, and by far, my best supply line. Premium Ultra, stop all the clowning around. And you know I, what? That's, that 100%. starts, the, the change starts with the consumers. Agreed. So, yeah. let's, um, let's kind of shift gears a little bit, but I think this is sort of a related topic. Shh, 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 shh. Yeah. What about local fish stores, the LFS? What What do you guys think in terms of the uh, the future role of the local fish store? I mean, they're such an important part. They were such an important part of the uh, reef keeping ecosystem when I started in this hobby. And um, you know, I'll admit, I, you know, I've uh, I've kind of strayed from the LFS in terms of uh, you know how I shop for corals and and how I um, you know interact with folks. But you know, can they survive in this kind of um, you know, online world where oh, I'm I'm not worried about I'm, the fish stores. I'm not worried about the fish stores either because the the goal of the reason why ACI Aquaculture was started 14 years ago was because you know I was just a hobbyist and it was hard to afford a hundred dollar booger acro frag, and it got to the point where I was just like you know what we can do this better and we can help these LFS out that are wanting these you know that that, that don't sell these ex exotic named corals and for for so much you know for all this money with you know you're going to have your different types of lfs you're going to have the you know saltwater geek store that is going to have the names on everything you're going to have some that have you know that that care about that a little bit and then you're going to have the mom and pops that are really just don't care at all they don't want anything to do with that kind of stuff so you know what the what the whole point of ACI was is that we can offer a premium aquacultured coral at a fair price so that everybody can afford it with lineage and a name on it so that you know the hobby is affordable for all you know and I and again it's it I get the whole thing we talked about this from the old school stuff to the new school and the new way of things but I think that as a as a whole when ACI gets to the point where I want to be, or where we want to be, is we want to have an overabundance of all these corals where we can offer them at a really amazing price so that the flat rate pricing going across the board on it, you know, so that we can export to Taiwan, you know, a thousand frags and they all basically were the same price point depending, you know, from SPS to 
LPS has a different price point because they grow slower and softies a different price point because they grow a little faster in some cases. But we wanted to have like an SPS price and an LPS price. And then we'd have like, you know, um, a euphelia type pricing. But if we can do things the way we want to do them, we want to have, you know, all stores around have, you know, a very competitive price point on all the corals. And you're not going to have, you know, one store selling a booger for $200 and, and another store selling a booger for, for $15 or $20. You know, it should be all right there, even though they're the same type of coral. We want, we, our goal is so that basically there's no, how do you say it? No, no you don't see the same coral somewhere else. Just because the name of the store, it's five times, ten times the price than what it is from that mom and pop that doesn't care about that name. So I think that's you know our ultimate goal down the road, and um, I'm going to meet it one day here soon. And I think it'll probably happen when there's no more corals being imported into the country, and um, it's maybe five, ten, fifteen years down the road. I hope that never really happens. But you know, Jake and you know you guys, we all have been seeing all these ups and downs and all arounds with it, and you know, preparing for it's what we're, what we're doing. And I think everybody from, you know, a, a, a small child to an adult should be able to have an aquarium in their home and it shouldn't cost them their, uh, you know, to maintain, or to, it shouldn't cost them, you know, a car payment or a, the cost of a car to set one up. You know what I mean? I mean, $10,000 to set up a 200 gallon reef tank is not unco- uncommon nowadays. Help $5,000 to set up a 30 or 40 or 50 gallon tank isn't uncommon these days. I remember when I started and I could set up my, I think I set my 54 gallon corner tank up, which was my best SPS tank I ever had as a hobbyist. And I think we paid, you know, less than $1,500 for the whole get up because I did a lot of do it yourself stuff. I didn't have the money to do it, but $1,500 isn't so bad, but nowadays, if you wanted to set it up for the cost of all the equipment, and I get inflation and, and everything, you know, but it's quite expensive for, you know, just an average guy working a full time job, has kids, has the payments of a car and his house and everything else to do with life. And paycheck to paycheck isn't going to allow you to have an aquarium in your home because it's not really a smart decision. You know, even though that child is begging you, screaming and kicking and hollering like I used to do when I was a kid because I wanted African cichlids in my house. And my mom and dad just said, go mow the lawns, do what you got to do. You know, kids nowadays, I mean, how many lawns do you have to mow nowadays to get a reef aquarium in your house? You know, how many lawns do you have to mow to get one frag of a premium named acro nowadays? I mean, what, $300 for a piece of yeah, coral this big? You know, it, it's – right. Chris, let me, let me stop you there. I know he'll yes. just keep going. He'll just keep, I going. keep going. I'm, I'm his <laughs> brakes. I'm not. I'm not interrupting. I'm not no, that not. rude. I just know, like he'll just keep going. And yeah, it's no, his you're wheels. Fine. You're fine. I'm not worried about Take local fish point. stores because I worked retail in the middle of the rise of internet sales. Right. Uh, very few people here will remember Custom Aquatic or Debron. Debron. Or, uh, you know, a couple others. Yeah, yeah, some super old ones. Um, (laughs) And that was the first, that was, you know, that was the first, like, death toll of the the store. Like, everybody was going to buy everything online. And I'm sure there's some area, like, it it is an expensive hobby, right? It's not hyper cheap. You're just, you can't set up a reef tank for the same price that you can set up, um, you know, a Central Central American, South American cichlid tank with a bunch of used equipment that you can buy on the local groups. But over the last 15 years in Denver, we've had a new store every year. There's a new store in Denver almost every single year without fail. And we have lost very few. We lose a store once every four or five. And during my entire you know, aquarium career, because I'm an aquarist. You guys just see the saltwater side. I got plenty of freshwater tanks. And I dabble in all kinds of freshwater stuff. But one thing that I have seen is most aquarium stores nowadays are saltwater Back in the day, back in the olden days of the oh, mid nineteen yeah. nineties, <laughs> it was all freshwater stores. Yep. And maybe they had a saltwater tank, not a saltwater section. Maybe they had a saltwater tank. <laughs> and then over time they had a saltwater section. And then they were half and half. And then they just had a little bit of freshwater. And now most stores, I think, in most areas, um, are gonna be primarily saltwater because there's a, a lot of money to be made. And the thing is, if you live in a smaller market, if one store goes down, those sales generally will feed into um, the other stores. And this is why, like, I will go to every store because I get some of my best frags from the freshwater store. 
because they order random stuff, just just big packages that they buy for like fifteen dollars wholesale from major wholesalers, you know, like Chris. They have no idea what the names are, right? They they just look at their list and they you know they price them according to that. And because no one's buying them, or very few people are buying them, I'll go in and I'll find just giant blast of moose polyps for like yeah. twenty five bucks. Yeah. You know, all kinds of stuff. I will buy Lords I don't need because it's $20 because it's been sitting there for two or three months because they bought a $5 mega frag pack from somebody and they just sit there and they, they look fine. You know, they don't have, they might have like VHOs over them, right? Or <laughs> yeah. they might have like 12 uh, year old <laughs> ecozotic LED strip lights that do the job. They do the job enough. So I'm not really worried about fish stores. The only complaint that I have about fish stores that they need to be doing better is their dry goods, man. Like if if I go to around all the fish stores to oh, you know, yeah. like in one day, I will find basic rigid airline at one or two of them. And when they don't yeah. have something in stock, you know what they'll say? Well, I can order that for you. Yeah. And I'm like, I have Amazon. I'm good. <laughs> no thanks. I will get a faster order from Amazon. So if the, the salt order, the, any aquarium store wants to thrive and flourish, carry the weird odds and ends that we need right now. For yes. a project, right? Give me, give me the barbs. Give me the true unions. Give me the things for the project that I freaking need right now. That's not in yep. stock at Home Depot or whatever, yep. right? They're they're all doing very well on the livestock front. They could do a little bit better with the fish and they're quarantining, but that's a you know the perennial is, issue. Is, um... But carry odds and ends that helps to round out an aquarium project. The stuff that you're not going to sell very often, but when I go into your shop and I find a, a bristle brush for cleaning some pipe, some rigid airline, a basic siphon, I'm going to remember that that store had what I need. It seems... It, it, you know, this is... Uh, I, was, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, it also seems that, um, you know, local fish stores do a lot of business with maintenance, and that is a big part of their business model, at least some of them. That should be. Right. It should some, be a big part of their stores, business. If they don't right, do so maintenance, the, the I best store, like, The best ahead. store in town is a service company exactly. that has a retail section open two days a week. Exactly. Don't kill yourself to be open every day. If you have a retail store, you, you need to close at least one day a week. So, at so. least one, a Monday and a Tuesday. Get your house in order. Place or receive your orders. You know, and just have one day uninterrupted from from testing water. And yeah. you know, I don't know if that it makes some... sense. If I had a retail store, if I ever got back into that, there's no freaking way I would do maintenance. I know how much it costs. I know how much it's worth. But it's just it's not the same business model. But if you're, you know, an up and coming shop, doing service, uh, aquarium maintenance is going to help you get that sale you of know, I, that stuff, it's... recurring, you know, revenue from consumables like your your media, your food, your cleanup crew, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead, Chris. Service service is huge for 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 LFSs, in my opinion, because it keeps them more relevant. Is, that's the way I look at it. I have I have a couple of shops that you know um, have been doing business with since pretty much we we started our company, and you know they were starting out about the same time. And I kept saying, "Why aren't you guys doing maintenance? Why aren't you guys doing maintenance?" Because when I had my shop in Tampa, um, that was what I did. I was the I was the service manager, and I went out and managed all the maintenance accounts. And without those maintenance accounts over the summer months when it was turtle slow around here in Florida, you know those maintenance accounts were bringing in revenue every mm -hmm. single week. And I had one of the biggest customers that I have, longest customers that I have. It took him up until like four years ago. So that's what, 10 years of me trying to get it into his head. You're nuts for not doing service. He finally bought a service truck, put one of his guys in because he had a lot of people asking for it. His service accounts have grown. He's got three trucks now on the road every single week. And he said, dude, he's like, I can't believe the amount of revenue I was missing out on for the last 10 years. And it's all the add-ons that he gets, all the times that his um, his maintenance guys are going to these these houses. Hey, do you want me to bring you any fish and corals? Do you want me to? You know, do you have? Uh, do you need frozen food? Do you need this? Do you need this? And some of these are weekly. I got a really nice coral. I think you know? you'd like. Do you want me yeah. to bring it over? It's exactly. You know, you don't have to. Cook. The, 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 the one thing that I will say is, you need to, if you're a business owner, you need to decide whether you're a service company with a retail, you know, section, or your yeah. retail company with some service. Right. If you are, a, you know, an up and coming shop and you need a hustle and to do a, a few service account, man, get, make that Piper boo boo 
Like, yeah. go get it. But you should go be working it. to the point where you have one full-time guy with one truck who does just that. Exactly. Because I have seen stores where the owner himself is doing the, the service accounts. Yep. Like, and the retail, you know, section suffers, right? So you yep. just don't, um, you, you know, don't, don't let your retail you know, side suffer because you're doing maintenance. You might as well just shut down the retail and just do all maintenance or no, vice versa. And you're exactly right. I mean, you know, that was one of the things that was that he made sure he did was is, was hire somebody that was his maintenance manager. And then he was in charge of making sure getting all of the the um, accounts handled. And as he needed help, they got the help. And it's grown into a huge he actually is thinking about separating it from his main retail side so that it's actually a completely separate business from the from the retail. And in a way that makes some that makes some sense because you know if you know um, he does have some issues down the road with the retail side, he still has the maintenance side and they're completely separated. But I want to touch base back to the point where you know you were mentioning about um, about uh, you know retail stores need to have more. Um, dry goods in their in their um, in their in their shops. I'm with you 100. percent But you want to know the biggest complaint that I get from my you know, and I have one of my customers. I love him to death. He's freaking awesome. I talk to him every single week, and every week he complains and cries about the internet and about he spent 25, 30 minutes, an hour with somebody, and then the guy came back in the next week and bought the thing online because he got it for ten dollars cheaper, and he could have bought it that day, spent all that time, you know. And I can understand a a retail store owners, you know, gripe with the consumers, you know, finding it ten dollars cheaper online or fifty dollars cheaper online. You don't want those customers. And not, no, you don't. But you don't want those customers. That is, I that agree. should not be shaping your inventory and your reef store. And I'm really glad I, that we we have a chance to talk about the professional side of things because. It's a huge segment of the reef aquarium industry that, you know, has a big influence on everything that we do here. But one thing that I think a, a lot of shop owners don't understand is, like, you, you're not going to custom order a, a pink Cinerina for somebody, right? They're yeah. not going to come in and say, I want a pink Cinerina or I want a green branchy hammer. You're going to have it in stock. And you have to have that same mentality with your dry goods. You literally need fifty to $100,000 of dry good inventory sitting there. And it will always sit there. And as it's depleted, you refill it up, right? That's you have to just have that stock. I think a um, right. That I, is what's going to get the customer to come in and, and and telling people that that come to your shop. Oh, I can order it for you. That's insulting. That's not why is. we're coming to your store. I think a big point to I can go online and get it tomorrow. I think a big point also to make about local fish stores is that you know when I started getting into the hobby years and years ago, there was a guy that had a kick-ass uh, SPS tank, and you know what? That guy was my mentor. And that's the advantage of being able to buy something from a local fish store is, is if you got somebody that knows what they're doing, has a system set up, follow their system. That's, it's worth waiting, you know, for uh, whatever Always. In, in terms of the only, the only thing you should have to wait for is a, is a non-standard reef uh, tank, right? That's exactly. the only thing that, that's, that's really going to take up a lot of for, space and right, a lot of but money. But new people coming into the hobby, you know, a local fish store with somebody that really knows what they're doing, it's just so, it's, it's invaluable. I mean, it's so key in terms of having I mean, success. That's another great point. I learned so much stuff from the local fish stores when I was growing up. I mean, Tony Rizzuto at Tony's Tropical Fish in York, Pennsylvania taught me everything I knew in the beginning of my saltwater, you know, because I worked there and he had saltwater he and freshwater a, he was a fish. Mentor. And I learned so – he was like my mentor, exactly. I mean, I still talk to him. I just talked to him last week. I mean, I mean, he's just like I can't believe where you've gotten with yourself after seeing you as a little, you know, tight running around, you know, harassing my cat and my fish tank. The point that out. you brought up, Keith, <laughs> is, is you were inspired by that display tank. Exactly. You would not have asked him – pointers on reefing if you didn't right. have if you didn't have an awesome inspiring reef tank i have worked for store owners who thought it was a waste of space and a waste of time and money you have to have display tanks exactly. worldwide corals has like 40 freaking display tanks you can't even see all of them but you walk in and you see a, a tank with ecotech marines uh, radions you see a tank with ais you think a tank with kessels you see you know big old lagoon tank you see a big fish display you see tons of nano tanks you got to have those fish you know those, those displays to inspire people because they're going to see the equipment in use they, they're going to see livestock and certain fish you know displayed that you can appreciate and then you can ask them a 
specifically specific things about how they're running this tank or that tank. And so that's another thing about the retail aspect. Like, you got to have at least one badass, you know, display reef tank. It should Couldn't be the first more. thing that you build and in, if your, it's in your store. And an SDS reef tank in your shop, you should say that everything in the aquarium is for sale as a frag. The biggest, I think, the biggest problem that that makes uh, consumers upset is when they have when there is this beautiful display tank in 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 there, and you know all these amazing corals in it, and nothing is for sale. Yeah. You know, I can understand if you have something that's super unique and it's going to be super hard to get your hands on again. You know, at that point, you say, you know what? Here's my I don't care price. Cause I don't want you to buy it, but if you really want to buy it for this kind of money, I'm happy to depart with it. And then you have all these SPS corals growing in your aquarium, you know, okay, when it's time to frag it here, let's put your name down. And when the frag's available, yeah. you can have a, fr I'll sell you a frag. That's of a big it. tease. You know, but that's the biggest problem that's a, that, is people, the, these shops have display tanks and nothing's for yeah, sale. That's out a of big them. tease. It's frustrating. The local shop down here in Tampa, one of my like again, one of my longtime customers, he's got a very large SPS tank, and he's got people constantly asking him for corals. And if it's fraggable, he will bust a frag off for every customer that asks him for a frag until it's down to the point where he can't sell frags off of it anymore. Wait list, it, wait list it. Exactly, that's what he does. Once he gets to that point, then he grows it out until. You know, and then when it's ready to frag again, he calls the people up that were first in line and it goes right down the line until he can't frag it again. And but that's the problem is a lot of these places don't do that. And no, it's not for sale. Um, you know, I don't know. That's a it's a big turnoff for me. If I go in and I want something, how do you know I can't afford what your what what your price is? Maybe I want that coral that bad. Maybe your I don't care price is in my budget, you know, and it, most likely it probably wouldn't be, but I mean, I think that's what, you know, all LFS really need to do is they need to make sure that they have, you know, um, that they're flexible with their display tanks and everything is for sale for a price. If it's something you, you know, you really want, people probably won't buy it for the, for the price you're going to have it. But local fish stores, um, I think, I don't think are ever going to go anywhere, but you know, like, like you were saying about, you know, everybody had fresh water back in the day. Well, it was because people were scared of saltwater. My mom and dad wouldn't even let me have a saltwater aquarium when I was growing up because my dad tried one back in the sixties <laughs> and couldn't keep anything alive in it. And he said, you're never getting saltwater while you live under my roof. <laughs> and rightfully so, you know, now he looks at me and says, wow, you know, I wish I'd let you got it back then. And maybe you'd be a little farther along in the, in the, in the hobby of the industry. But you know, it's, it's, um, it, Nowadays, like you said, Jake, there's more people that are saltwater only stores, but I honestly believe that that's part of the reason why we have more issues with this industry and the name gaming and people, you know, wanting specific, um, you know, names on corals. If they were all like the, when I say a mom and pop shop, if they were all like the mom and pop shops that I'm talking about, mom and pop shops I'm talking about are the full line pet stores that buy corals from me. And you were talking about cheap frag packs, you know, one of my biggest driving sales for the week on, at ACI, I mean, I've got a guy that's cutting between 500 and 1,000 frags on a daily basis to keep up with the frag market. And I have to rotate them in and out because I can't just send a freshly cut, chopped up frag. I mean, a lot of places will do that. That's not how we work. I've never been that way. And since we started doing selling frags wholesale, we might have been the first to sell wholesale frags back 14 or 15 years ago. But, you know, we always healed everything up. And we sell uh, a 50 lot of frags shipped to the customer's door. The shipping's free. You have flat rate for the for the for the shipping or for the for the um, 50 lot, and customers go crazy over that. And that's the thing that you know, Jake. You were saying you know you can get. I send out you know a few acros. Believe it or not, in that cheap little 50 lot of frags, you know, one of my store owners might get a um, an Acropora Tenuous that might have some fancy schmancy name on it that some guy's selling for $400 for a small frag. And I got one that's three times the size of it that I just sent them in a cheap frag pack. And wholesalers will take unflattering colonies and they'll divide them up into smaller, you know, very affordably priced uh, you know, frags. And they will sit at some of these non-reef specialist stores, and man, Ooh. I will find some fire, <laughs> some no-name fire at no-name shops. Yes. You know, sometimes it's the little holes in the walls that, you know, it's like, yeah, sure, it might be dingy and humid. They might have some reptiles. It might smell like rat poop or whatever. Like, just just look around. Go to a bunch of places. And, I'm you not know, going I, to. 
<laughs> I say, I'm not going after the fanciest name store in town. I'm going for that mom and pop down the road that doesn't really, you know, focus and focus on the corals. I'm going there to see what they have first. And more than likely, you know, you're going to find something that's going to be, you know, very well worth the, you know, look through all of their tanks, even if they might not be the most flattering looking, you know, like you said, you can find some gems in some of these shops. And I, that's, would, that's the, one that's of the funnest it. for me. There's probably about 20, 25 stores bet between Colorado Springs, Denver and Fort Collins, Boulder and everything in between, man, I'll hit up all of those guys. And I'll, I'll blow my budget every time, yeah. every time. <laughs> I know we you can know, talk about professional stuff all the time, and you—it's funny you yeah, give us some, yeah, give us one word. Coral. You say retail store, and we're just like we're gone for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other questions yeah. you want to bring up, Keith? You know, I think one one um, you know question I wanted to uh, ask you guys, and, 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 and this is sort of related to what we're just talking about. But you know, how can we bring in new folks to the hobby? You know, how how can this oh, be? Uh, I don't think we need to. <laughs> I don't think you we don't need think to. That. I think it. I know it's happening just just fine right now. Nothing of greater importance is how can we educate with a, 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 a with a better a set of skills for the next generation because you know nowadays uh, you, you know the echo, the online echo chamber will tell you the same thing on Facebook and Reef to Reef and Humble Fish and a, you know, a few others. And so you think you have different sources when it's like the same person posting in all the groups that you're looking at. And so I think that you know, the, the greater challenge is how do we inspire people to just enjoy the coral that they have or the coral that's available making it to so them. complicated. Yeah, yeah. just is it pretty? There's so much complication in is it, this, is it, in this is industry. Is it neon green? Is it neon orange? Is it bright red? But do how you do you like cut, it? How do you, you cut through it? the Instagram stuff? You know, I mean, you go on to Instagram and it's, it's just, hard. You know, it, get, I it don't. gets people crazy. I don't. the results. You know, maybe I should maybe I should start my YouTube channel up with you know here's the results of keeping things simple and not making them complicated and you know refining the way reefing is done is what we've done i think you know i mean i think the way we're doing things is so simple i mean literally i can look at my control and say okay everything's good okay wait a minute something's a little bit off here mess around with it fix it if it, keeping it simple is going to bring people in to stay rather than making it you know sound like you need to have a science degree to run a reef aquarium I mean, you don't i mean it's really not hard to do if you just go with the basics especially as a beginner hobbyist you don't need to have all that fancy smancy equipment on your aquarium to to run something to, to run it i mean basically you need a, a good set of test kits you need a good protein skimmer or an algae scrubber um, you can do both, but uh, honestly, I think they both aren't necessary after my experiences with them. Um, but, you know, if, if things were kept simple, I think it wouldn't scare some people away from, from the industry. Because I think there's a lot more people that would I mean, get into I've, it. I think, I think we have scared away. We have too many people joining the hobby right now. Like, I'm not trying to be the old man, get off my lawn, you know, <laughs> mentality and saying, don't break the mold. It's really fun because, you know, I was young when fragging – first dropped and there was old guys who were just like oh i don't want no little my tiny frags you know i want a giant colony and that's uh, given us a lot of a lot more diversity and a lot more knowledge and a lot more experimentation i love taking the same coral putting it in five tanks and seeing which condition it looks or grows the best so we don't you know we don't want to stifle the innovation that's super important i don't think we need new people in the reef aquarium hobby they're the guys who are coming in and after a few years they're the ones who think that the current coral prices like they have the shifting baseline syndrome they think that the current coral prices are normal they don't know how to right. go find those 20 30 40 50 dollar coral frags and colonies or just to go around and and, and find some traded right. in trunks right. that the that the store just wants you to take but off their hands for you, just pocket change so i don't know if we have an issue um with with the growth in the reef aquarium hobby i i it's a, that's a good problem, but I think we, um, the, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, right? We still want to let people be creative and experiment, um, and see what sticks, but I would just really encourage people to just master the basics. There is no magic solution that you're going to add to your tank. That's going to supersede having, uh, the fundamentals of, you know, nutrients, uh, physical chemistry and mineral balance. Um, uh, you know, hands so, down. So that kind of uh, leads into kind of my final question, and maybe just wrap it up here. Is um, 
you know, and I think you, you sort of answered this already, Jake, but, uh, you know, for both of you guys, was there really an aha moment in your reef keeping career in which you kind of made a fundamental change in terms of how you kept the reef tank that really did make a big difference moving forward? I had an aha moment with everything. <laughs> I had a ha ha moment when, 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 when alkalinity buffer and carbonate hardness was not clear. And one day I realized, oh, that's one of the two parts, you know, main two minerals that builds up a coral. I had a ha ha moment when I was starting to get bored with the reef aquarium hobby and I put on my first cheap blue LEDs of her corals and saw fluorescence in a way I'd never seen. You know, I had a ha moment, you know, the first time I, I set up two maxi jet power heads together because we had no propeller pumps and I got all all the water moving together and conceptualize, you know, gyre flow as a technique for moving more water in your tank. Had another aha moment when I realized that my tanks were a, like deserts, like nutrient deserts, and no <laughs> amount of feeding was really keeping up without making the tank super dirty. And I started adding nitrate. That was a year ago. You know, so I have aha moments about everything. every every week, every day. I mean, aha moments are what keep me going in this industry. I mean, it's it's what it makes it interesting because there's always something that you think. When you think you know what you're doing, I mean, you probably do, but there's always something that's going to change your ways of doing things. And maybe it's just a little bit here and a little bit there, but there's, you know, without the constant um, learning aspect of it, you know, it, I don't think I'd be interested into it. I have a very short attention span. And, and when, it, when it comes down to aha moments, I would have to say, the biggest one that I had was the pH thing just about eight, eight months ago. Um, that's probably the biggest, but, um, the, another aha moment for me was when I first started setting up aquariums, everybody always said, have a big monster return pump with your, with your, you know, I, I don't agree with that at all. It's, it was, um, small return pump and just flow something for flow in your main system. I mean, when it comes to flow yeah. through the tank, I'd like to do the yeah. thought of experiment. If you have four times turnover per hour, that's a yes. hundred times per day. Do you yes. really think your tank's going to be fundamentally different if you have more than a hundred times turnover <laughs> per day? Again, the, it's, it's, it's about the use case scenario. Do you have a heavily stocked fish display and you feed a lot? Okay, then you might need to have a lot more flow through the aquarium, right? Um, but Chris started touching on, uh, on this. Um, I, my biggest, not so much aha moment, but in uh, like a turning point, is I went out of town, went to Europe, and I had simultaneous tank crashes at my house and um, at the university where I also had some aquariums. And ever since then, um, I have operated under the basis that I'm always f missing something, that mm -hmm. something is about to break, right? This is why every Double one everything. of my, yeah, every one of my skimmers, every one of my return pumps, and to a slightly lesser degree, my, my circulation pumps, I just assume stuff is breaking all the time, right? So that's why I will deep clean my protein skimmers. I will deep clean my return pumps. <laughs> when I had those simultaneous meltdown, I don't even remember what happened. But now I, uh, it's, not like, it's not like it's constant anxiety. It's just this thing in the back of my mind that, that, that really pushes me to double check my work on everything. Right. I went through everything. I, I went, I've gone through chemistry. I assumed I was doing salinity wrong and I used hydrometers, the swing arm hydrometers, refractometers, digital refractometers, um, conductivity meters. And I just, I absorbed myself into that. Same thing with the pH. There's multiple pH scales, y'all. There's multiple. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, so yeah. some products might be produced with one pH scale versus another. And I just assume, yeah. you know, for a long time that I was doing everything, not necessarily wrong, but I could do everything better. Right. Yes. So I think one of the keys to success exactly. of having a reef tank is just assume that you've missed something. Mm -hmm. Assume that like that, that make a lot of assumptions. Now, I don't want to people to just get their reef it, tanks, Jake, but just always kind of have it in the back of your mind that, that it just takes one little thing. You can, can have a thriving better. reef tank, or, or you can do it better. That's more about pushing it more than like checking right. your, your, your work. But you could have a thriving reef tank, and all of a sudden you can have some issues in your tank, and you have no <laughs> idea because you're not doing anything different. You have to check everything, right? Yep. Your magnet mount. Mm -hmm. Magnet yep. mounts you know, historically have oh. you know, always – like plastic is, does, does not hold water. Like water seeps through every kind of plastic. You need space-age yes. plastic to have it actually be totally impermeable to water. So in a long enough timeline, all your magnets are going to fail. 
Not, not maybe not yeah, all of them, practice. but so having the attitude and, and, and approaching your protein skimmer, your return pump, your flow pump, your lighting, your chemistry, your testing, your testing, your testing, just double check your work and be like incredibly confident that you've done the fundamentals right. And then you have the luxury of dealing with some of the more frivolous things like trace element dosing, boosting your pH or digging into the aquabiomics and your bacteria films. For me, you know, my, um, I was just going to add, you know, for, for me, my aha moment early on in my reef keeping career was don't tinker with the tank, keep the hands out of the tank, do not um, try to upset the apple cart and leave things alone. I just I found that um, the more I uh, you know sit back and watch the tank, especially with SPS, things do a lot better. When you start to kind of you know obsessing about one coral being placed over here or over there and starting to move things around, I think it just leads to trouble. And you know the other thing for me is just keeping up like what you're talking about, Jake, in terms of maintenance and. I, it, it's really, really important to try to, you know, every three months I do the deep clean on the return pumps. You know, I clean my dosing heads, the peristaltic pumps. I don't want to have any uh, surprises. So I think that's... Um, I, I, I think there's one thing that would be super important for everybody to hear and everyone to be reminded about is this is an aha moment I've had twice. Um, there was a talk at iMac West on the Queen Mary in Long Beach and this guy was saying, and it's something you might you know, know but not really uh, fully mentalize, is that if you have 100 corals in your tank, three to five of them are always going to not be keeping up with the pack. Do not, and it goes into what you're saying, Keith, do not start changing your reef tank because three to five percent of your corals aren't happy. Exactly. Like it'd be better for you to just let them die than to start re-examining the entire recipe yeah. and upsetting all the balance. And I had to have that moment again because now I'm about up to about a thousand corals. And so now I have to be okay with 10 to 20 of them not I'd be peaking. Unhappy. Not peaking. You're not going to keep a thousand corals happy. You dive a natural coral reef. Dude, 5%. Like One of the things you learn about natural coral reefs is if corals never died, reefs would never form. Right, it's the same thing with exactly. forests. Exactly, it's the same with any 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 kind of ecosystem. It's like a cut reef building, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you know, if, if you're a, a, a large you know large scale operation, you should expect five percent of your corals to always be suffering, you know, unless they die out and then you're you know you're left with whatever. <laughs> if you have fifty corals in your tank or you know twenty five corals in your tank. If 24 of them are, or 48 of them are just looking amazing and one or two are dying, make a note of it, double check your work. But sometimes that coral, it's just got extraneous factors that are pissing it off. And I think, you know, all of us have been doing this long enough. We have seen the most harm done to beautiful reef tanks when people are trying to overcorrect yeah. because one to 2% of their yeah. corals aren't thriving. Well, that's the problem with the seven hundred dollar frag you buy. And if that coral is the one in your tank that's not doing good, and it's five percent, it's one, it's one of the five percent. You know what are they doing? Oh, I just spent seven hundred dollars on this coral. That's the problem with an acro frag that's this big that was broken off of a wild or maricultured coral and sold to you as something that it really isn't. It's just a wild coral frag in most cases. But you know, I can think of an aha moment here right now, Jake. It's actually you and Evan were here. The aha moment that I have to say that it was like when I cleaned up all your thing. cables. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> when we wiped down all your pipes. You no, know, when you went and boiled some water and stuck it through my venturis on my protein skimmers and I'm like Duh. <laughs> it was more of a dumb moment than aha, uh -huh, but you know, it was. Uh, you learn I've something never new. Seen my you learn like something that. new every day, right? Oh yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's it's again, it's what keeps me going with this. You know, that I learn from you know people like Jake. From you know, I learn from people that aren't even really experienced in the industry because they just come up with some weird idea that that works, and you know, it's it's a never changing um, way of doing things and just thinking and and you know uh i i i really like what you just said jake with the uh with the um 
you know, not every coral and 5%, you know, is, 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 is not acceptable to me, but it makes complete sense to me. If that makes sense at all, you know, I don't like seeing any coral suffer. And, you know, with all the corals that we are having our care, you know, we don't lose very many corals, um, once they hit our systems. But, you know, if, if I actually look back to what we actually do lose and it's, Again, you're not going to make every single coral that's in your aquarium happy. It's not possible because of the different reef environments where these things come from. You know, five uh, percent is really not all that bad, and I think we might be a little bit below that. Um, and you just gave me a whole different way of looking at you know when I see a coral happy and healthy for two weeks, and then all of a sudden it just decides it's not happy anymore. You know, I have to chalk it up to you. Okay, there was, it was fine for that short period of time, but it was obviously wasn't happy. And there's nothing I could have done really to probably change that. Um, even though I do my damnedest to change it, chemically dipping, oculinic acid, whatever it is I'm doing, you know, we always try to make things better. But there's, it, like, like Jake said, there's just times where you're not going to be able to save something and it's, you want to do everything in your power to, and it's just, you're not going to be able to do it. Back to what Keith was saying, though. I'm still, you know, still fleshing out some of the tanks and, and the corals and the fish. And if I get like a, a, a big batch of fish and I have to deal with them and then put them out, that's a risk, right? That's a risk of introduction. Or right. like, for example, I, you know, added a uh, regal blue tang to two different displays. One display, he had a little bit of ick and I knew it's, you know, bare bottom and it wasn't going to be an issue. But if you're not messing with the tank, those things won't come up. Right. So every time I get new stuff, I have to, I need a long like buffering period before I'm ready to start dealing with the, all the challenges that are going to come with that. So I'd like to, you know, acquire my livestock in pulses. So I'll, you know, I'll get a bunch of corals for a little while, stop and just make sure I, I can take care of them. And then I'll get a, you know, a batch of fish and then stop. And it's, it's incredible. Like, right. You could have a crazy, awesome, uh, coral collection. You spend way too much money for an overhyped uh, torch, whatever it's called. And because that one coral costs you so much and it's not thriving, it takes away the enjoyment of your entire tank. It does. It does. Right? And, and, and if you're really, you know, watching your reef tank and you're constantly messing with it, you should expect to just have a, a revolving door of problems. Right. So to Keith's you know, comment, to me, not messing with tank, your tank is less about the stability and the growth. It's more about the enjoyment, because when you don't have any corals dying, when you don't have any fish fighting or squabbling or getting sick, all of a sudden you have your perfect you know, little coral garden and you can just sit back and there's no stressors. I mean, yeah. So. So for me, it's just like, you know, when, when I when I acquire livestock, I just do it in pulpus, pul per, uh, pulses and be mentally prepared to, you know, to deal with whatever small issues are going to come up. Sometimes being yep. lazy with the tank is a good thing. Yeah. It is sometimes. There's, exactly there's, there's, right. there's almost fewer problems that will come up with leaving your tank alone versus messing yep. with it. Well, you know, when you say this is the same lazy, thing that you said, just rephrased. When you say lazy, I think of I think of Joe Ayula and his Lars. Lars. <laughs> and 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 then I also think of Joe Ayula in a post he made probably five, six years ago, holding a hammer coral in his hand that was given to him by somebody that grew it out saying, Who gives the biggest frags? And we're talking about frags and how things used to be. And Joe's one of those old school guys that, you know, they used to trade chunks of corals back and forth with each other. You know, Stuber's Acro, you know. I mean, I was talking to Julian over at Aquashell about Stuber's Acro, and they used to give away chunks of it that were like this big, you know, these huge monster one-inch thick branches of it. I got a piece from RA that I'm growing out. I need it. I, you know what? Call it's up RA, the... man. Just because that's your classics. I should. I should because I, I – you know, that's the thing is that I'm missing some classics in my collection. I mean, I've got a pretty decent collection and I just want it to continue to grow. But I do have some um, classics that are missing. You need to see the Acropora Florida. I'm surprised Amanda didn't just post that photo up um, since uh, she took a photo of it specifically. You know, she, because, um, she, I think she uh, she sent it to me right before the show. I didn't have any time to uh, to put it into the, oh, the she light. Did. Yeah, I think, I think she sent me some stuff and I just didn't have the time to uh, bring it in. It, it's it's amazing. I mean, that, that coral is not a classic, but you know. Oh, it is a classic, Jake. I think you were talking it's, about it's, that, Jake. Right? That's one of the corals you're going to uh, 
send along. Yeah, no, that one's a, an older classic. It was because it was traded by, you know, the early generation of, of, of stickheads. Um, yeah. Man, that one traces back over 20 years. Um, Kevin Poe, Kevin Poe Cal. I yeah. thought that was um, one that you collected yeah. from Solomon, though. Do you remember him, Keith, from I, like I way back in the I day? Do. The SPS forum yeah. and Reef Central. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, old, 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 old school. I don't remember what his uh, store name is, but man, that, that thing that makes. That thing makes a green slimer look dull. <laughs> oh my gosh, I have it's I have crazy. a nice, I have a really nice green slimer in the tank, and you know I noticed the horror, the, the the Florida for sure before I noticed the slimer. And if you put them right next to each other, you used to think the slimer was bright, but that that Florida dude. <laughs> oh my god! Does Lord. it does it grow as aggressive as a slimer? Um, you know what? I've had it now for a year, and it's probably. Oh man, it's more than five. That thing uh, was like Slimer this big puts all its of it at, puts all of its energy into just purely staghorn growth. Yeah, but Acropora yes. Florida is not like a pure staghorn, so it has like a lot of side branches. Like so high- it grows fast, but it's just not going to add linear growth the same way that uh, a purely staghorn Acropora Yunjai will. Yeah, my my Jeez. my green Slimer actually grew out of the water. Yep. Oh, I believe that. Jake sent me this piece. It was uh, a nice sized chunky, you know. As people would say nowadays, mini colony, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it is now, I mean, it takes up, you know, about that much space and it's got like seven or eight nice branches on it. And what I can't wait for is that real true Acropora Florida growth. It grows like a staghorn, but then it's got all these little branchlets growing uh-huh. off that main branch. And it's like, it, it's one of the most unique, um, acros that you can acquire and this one here i've seen them americultures where they were you know like a dark green or you know like a brown brown yeah they come in like a a, a greenish (laughs) a green and then very rarely what i call the toxic green i have seen like countless acropora floridas while diving Uh, i have seen one or two that were toxic green this thing is you know when you said you were sending it to me i was like yeah and then when I got it, I was like, Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. you know. And now that I have it and it's growing out, um, if if I have anything to do with it, I'd like to have that bad boy up available for as aquaculture from you to me to the world. Yeah, that's, that's a fun one. Again, a twenty year old strain. All right, hey, guys. That's awesome. So nope. um, Pip, perhaps we should uh, put a wrap on this one and and um, put it to same save some for next time. Save some some for, for next go. time. This was uh, <laughs> awesome. I just want to thank you guys. So so much for taking the time. I love talking reef, uh, especially with, with you guys. And I also want to just uh, thank everybody for uh, for tuning into the show and contributing to the chat. And um, please leave some um, you know comments if you have any questions for any of us, and and we'll hopefully we'll be able to get back to you. But I, I do like the part where when I was on your show a, f- a handful of months ago. They got uh, broke the record for you know the longest uh, stream that you had because you wanted to cut it down right when we were warming up, <laughs> and then Chris, you know, he, Chris can talk, and so he broke the record by just like ten minutes or something. Think, so now we're here together, just shattering think, it, almost obliterating it. We did shatter, the, totally shattered. We did shatter the record, and uh, I know awesome. I know you guys could keep going on, and and I I could too, you know. I mean, somebody made a comment. It's getting close to your bedtime, Keith, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's just do it again some other time. Let's just do it again yeah. some other time. So listen, guys. Keith, thanks for having us. Thanks to yes. everyone for you know listening and participating. And uh, yeah, I hope you got something out of it. Yeah, so so certainly as we talked about, uh, check out Reef Therapy. It's a it's an awesome um, uh, podcast that's on the uh, Reef Builders YouTube channel as well as the uh, major podcast providers. And look out for uh, the ACI Aquaculture YouTube channel. Chris, I am. Uh, Really looking forward to uh, checking out that content. I also want to thank um, Marine Depot for being a sponsor and supporting the show. So please keep them in mind for your reef keeping needs. And I also want to thank all of you folks that watched tonight, as well as the, uh, the folks that contributed to the Super Chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. So my next live stream, this is going to be a good one too, is going to be on Thursday, July 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I got David Saxby. Who's going to be on? Oh boy! Yeah. Oh boy! He, um, <laughs> he has. Uh, I know well, David pretty well, man. I'm really curious to see what he's going to have he, to say. Um, he, he might have one of the more uh, famous reef tanks around, and it's yes. it's pretty incredible. So I'm I'm certainly looking forward to that. So it should be another 
great show and and hope you guys uh tune in for that so until then be safe out there and we will see you next time later all right thanks